Okay. Welcome to the College of Complexes. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody here. The format of the college consists of the following format. The first thing we do is we have a brief announcements period where Charlie will give a little bit about upcoming programs on the college and any other announcements to the general community. Then our speaker will speak upwards to maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Then we'll have a question and answer period where you know we'll entertain questions and a little bit of general discussion. Then at the end of the presentation, we'll allot time for what we call the rebuttal period where you'll get a chance to uh, speak on, on or off topic about it. We usually allot about five or six minutes per speaker depending on how we do it. The rebuttals haven't been as relevant as they would have been during live, but we do have some good, interesting ones. I'll get the last word and then we usually finish up about nine or so, but depending on how the conversation goes, we could go much later since we're on Zoom and not having to work within the constraints of the restaurant. Okay, um, I'm going to let turn it over now for our announcements page. And I know Charlie is gonna have something. I'll share screen on the... Uh, announcements when you're ready charlie so go ahead and take it away all right welcome everyone to meeting 3631 of the college of complexes the playground for people who think uh first of all we have a relatively new email google group uh which i recommend everyone join Instructions are right at our website uh, at the top. And there also is a meetup group. So you get one or two updates on the topic uh, of the next meeting and not a lot of traffic. So I highly recommend everyone do that and sign up so as to get on our email list. And although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs on September the 4th. Oops. We will be having our uh, special Labor Day speaker. Charlie, you don't have the uh, the links are wrong on your on your homepage. I tried to click September, and I'm getting August. Let's find out here if we can get to it. Okay, we got it now. So go ahead. I've got September 4th up. Uh, all right. You'll fix Begin that later. Again, uh, a special Labor Day speaker, uh, Mark Burroughs, who has 40 some years experience in the organized labor movement, uh, will be speaking on the topic of our accomplishments and challenges past the present. So if you want to keep up on uh, employment issues, it'd be a good uh, program. Uh, he's a bit of a um, uh, historian in this regard. So uh, if you like history of uh, activism, uh, he's the guy to listen to. On September the 11th, um, yeah, and considering September the 11th, uh, the co-founder of the Academics for Truth, uh, uh, Jim Pfizer, will be coming to talk, bring us an update on the latest information theories regarding 9-11 and a talk entitled Reality or Illusion. That's what everybody in the college should ask themselves. Are you dealing in reality? like me, or are you dealing in illusions? Okay, on September the 18th, a representative of Green America, a nationwide environmental organization, will be telling us about uh, their activities, their mission. Uh, they put out a nationwide publication, very informative, and the links are there if you'd want to find out more. So we're going to have eco topics on September the 18th. On the 25th, uh, you also will be returning um, uh, Michael C. Comfort is an author. Uh, he's put together a book. He took a tour 
of the United States. I believe you went in Mexico and Canada at the height of the pandemic, which we are now in, I guess, phase four of the pandemic. Nevertheless, he was soliciting views and opinions regarding it. So it should be an ensuing interesting discussion. Uh, traveling next, uh, October the 2nd is our next open date. If you would like to speak uh, or know of an organization or individual we should invite, please contact me. Uh, on October the 16th, we're going to have someone, um, a professor uh, uh, in crime uh, from uh, DuPage County uh, speak on senior fraud prevention whether this is in person, over the phone, or online. He has a weekly radio program that he produces on uh, criminal activities to defraud the public. In particular now, they're taking advantage of the COVID situation uh, to stiff you out of your dough. Uh, tentatively, we have a speaker for the 23rd of October. Uh, he has uh plans to have a hiking and possibly a biking trail that will circle the entire earth <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> uh so that i'm waiting his description for a confirmation uh regarding that so if you want to take a hike and go around the world uh he's putting together a map or plans mm -hmm. that will make that possible uh, and after that, the next open date is October the 30th. Actually, we're looking for something uh, around that time uh, in conjunction with the United Nations. It is the UN Day on October the 24th, but I'll let you know what we come up with if we get the World Federalists here or the UN Association or somebody. Okay, that's about it. Take it away, Tim. Thank you. All right, I just also want to let you know that we do have a Texas campus that it's meeting on Thursday nights at, on Thursdays, and they're uh, still on Zoom meetings. Uh, and on Thursday, well, they had the Thursday, September 2nd, Labor Corps, Labor is a core of the progressive movement. Gene Lance, President of Alliance for Retired Americans, Continuation Dallas, the Dallas AFL-CIO, working with labor in solidarity, will discuss and argue how American labor has been responsible for most of the progress we have made and will make in the future. They also uh, are looking for speakers and their next one open meeting is on September 9th. Tom Barry's uh, email is there as well as John Beasley. They both have attended here and uh, they're ready to go. Okay, is there anybody else who's got an announcement for the good of the community real quick that we can, before I get started on my presentation? Karina, I know you usually have something, but if you don't, Ellen or anybody else real quick with a quick announcement for the good of the, uh, the uh, college. And for me. Okay, go ahead, Karina, if you got something for us. None for me. Okay. Oh, okay, I'll say something. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, one thing is this regarding the Dallas talks. Um, I don't know, I hope they're all available like we have them on our website you know, in, in the past. But I highly recommend the one from last week uh, talking about brain health. Um, and this guy has a great book, uh, Normal from Afar, uh, on how he brought himself back from dementia and trauma of a brain, you know, trauma. Watch um, my Facebook page. We're gonna have a lot of links going up next week on this yeah, stuff. Sure. Good. Okay. So and, uh, the other thing is that world beyond war. I see Tracy there. We're making a lot of progress. It's a good team building around mostly Tracy's work and some of the others of finding, um, you know, the billions that are being spent uh, by the Chicago pension funds um, on Raytheon. And, we have an event. War. That's right. coming that's... up to announce. Good. Okay. I just wanted to say that that's an active group that people might want to join. All right. Okay. Thank you. With, that's with all. That, 
any other announcements? If not, I'll get started on my presentation in a couple in a minute or two. Um, anyway, well, welcome everybody. I'm the uh, principal speaker tonight, and I'm going to be talking a lot about why we need nuclear power. <laughs> the first part of my presentation is going to be a, one recycled that'll prove a little bit about what why we need electric power and why nuclear is gonna be a way in it. Then I'm gonna update that with some information from a old Thor, from a pre Thorian presentation called the Roadmap to Nowhere. And then I'll be updating a little bit about the present day, uh, what's going on now in China and some of the other countries right now about the present state of the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. So without further ado, we're gonna get started here on my presentation, if I can share a screen here. We'll be ready in just a second here. This uh, presentation goes back to the, uh, let me start here if I can get the, have to get this thing up and running here real quick. So we go to the, uh, from beginning. Okay. Can you, can everybody see that now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Now this was one given in 2014, but it will pre prepare and, and show why it was there. Some of the statistics may be a little bit outdated, but the general trends have not changed. The first thing we gotta say is that electricity is a good thing and brings many benefits. It has over the last 150 years eliminated things and we use it for lighting, washing, entertainment, frees people from drudgery. The electric motor and some of the plants made in it have been nothing short of a miracle. We also have used electricity for communications and internet usage. As of right now, about 8% of our current electric power load around the world actually powers the internet. And, you know, most of it we've used for communications and uh, just generally bringing us a little closer. Could it be that the prosperity electricity replies that we're simply using too much a good thing? Can we restrain its growth? Do we generate it? by other means. And that can be a really true Faustian paradox. We've all seen how electric power benefits mankind, but at the same time, we have to generate it through various forms of power plants, whether it be through renewables or a coal or nuclear or whatnot. But if we want prosperity, we're gonna need more electric power. You see the global environmental problems have mounted. Global warming with polar bears, uh, drying out of the deserts, the, uh, you know, industrialization of, of farming and fish and overfishing. And of course, we have war over oil. But, you know, and they're going to be amounting. We have just recently, we have a new superstorm coming into New Orleans tomorrow on a hurricane. But the thing is, um, in Dennis Meadows book, limits to growth. It showed effects of finite resources. As population goes up, industrial output goes up, pollution goes up. And he did this by 2010. He said it showed effects of limited growth on finite resources. And as you get into 2050, you can see that pollution and industrial output go way down as we start running out of, of things to do. Um, population, however, will go down because it's stable in developed countries. We had 6.9 people in 2010. <laughs> and uh, the reason why population goes down in developed countries is very simple. Children are no longer a source of assets, but are much more expensive to raise. You know, you want to have a child today, it costs about a quarter to a half million dollars to raise the kid and he doesn't leave the nest until maybe uh, his early 20s versus before in a, far, in, a high, in a in a uh, farming community you can usually put the work kid to work right away prosperity however also stabilizes population according to the CIA world fat book you get an income of, of over about eight thousand dollars people have less much less children and because they're more expensive to raise you're not going to have as many However, the reason why we had much more children back in a hundred years ago was that they didn't survive. A lot of them just didn't survive. And when you have prosperity, you also have medical, um, medical knowledge that increases. And it just gets a little more stable as you get more prosperous. There's a stable replacement rate of 
three or 2.1 children per woman and prosperity at about maybe $8,000 per capita is what usually brings stability to a population. So one of the biggest trends of the 21st century are now is that we're gonna be having an aging population. Population will go down. And that also means that uh, we'll have a little more prosperity in it, but we are gonna need much more energy. Prosperity depends on energy. As you get more annual kilowatts per capita, and it, it requires more GDP, and that's what people are gonna want. I mean, in the early 2010s, while we were all concerned about terrorism in the United States, the equivalent of three United States went online energy-wise and population-wise from China and India. The thing is, nations with over 10 millions of populations need more power. And uh, they also depend on energy for prosperity. And I don't think we're, that mankind will not go back by losing its prosperity. We in the West have enjoyed it through the usage of fossil fuels and other renewable resources and nuclear power. And we've been able to increase our energy consumption, but just wait until we run out of power or have to start conserving more. Mm -hmm. The thing is energy and coal use is growing rapidly in developing nations. We can see now that uh, from this graph was from 2012, but you can see world coal use has been going up quite a bit. And as a matter of fact, conservation won't stop the growth. U.S. cuts per capita energy in half to 6,000 kilowatts per person per year. We may be able to do it. The thing is, the rest of the world nations cut our growth to achieve the same rate. We still are going to grow in our electric power consumption and energy consumption. Technology policies lies at the core of climate change challenge. If we try to restrain emissions without a fundamentally new set of technologies, we'll wind up stifling economic growth, including the development prospects of billions of people. We will need much more than a price on carbon. Technologies developed in the rich world will need to be adapted, adopted rapidly in poorer countries. The thing is our electrical grid, you got to remember is the electricity just doesn't come on instantaneously. It's got to be generated. It has to be transmitted through electric transmission lines. And it's got to be distributed through a substation and then another substation and then eventually to your homes. Right now, it's a decentralized grid. And, you know, there is talk about, uh, you know, having the home solar power feed energy back to the grid. But the thing is, once you get above about a 12 percent um power usage, you get things like grid renaissance, and you're going to need a lot more transmission lines and other things to get it to a decentralized grid. It's, they're, they're smart grid technologies working, but it doesn't really have a chance to uh, contribute to our uh, electric power distribution. This is where uh, I get most of my power from uh, where I live on 503 Summit Street. And that is from the East Dundee peaking facility that runs on natural gas. Most of my power is transmitted out from, uh, from, from the nuclear power is a stable load. But if it peaks, this is where it comes. East Dundee is about maybe five or six miles from me. But here's what's really funny. I get it down and step down at the Algonquin Road neighborhood substation. It then goes to the Webster Street line transformer and then into my service entrance at my home. And there is my home where I have an apartment above my garage, where if you look at that fan up in here is the room I'm in right now where I'm speaking from. Uh, the Larest Wind Facility is the lead to Kelb Wind Energy Center. And that's well over 100 miles from my home. And there, yes, the wind power is going up, but it still is not going to provide the amount of power that all the Chicago land needs. In a lot of ways, we're like France, because in 2013, we were getting about 8,000 kilowatts per hour from nuclear. Coal was the next biggest source of our power in Illinois. Natural gas and other renewables were barely a contributed thing. But in a lot of ways, uh, France is still heavily reliant on nuclear. And they made that decision in the 80s to get off oil and their 
other power by going strictly to uh, nuclear is our large source of uh, power. Illinois energy production estimates are they're going to be using crude oil, biofuels, other renewable energy, but generally it's going to be nuclear and coal. And if we phase out the nuclear plants, we're going to be going back to natural gas, biofuels, and uh, crude oil to generate our power, and we're not going to get rid of the power needs. Illinois is a key transportation hub for crude oil and natural gas moving throughout North America with over a dozen interstate natural gas pipelines, two natural gas market centers, several petroleum and petroleum-based pipelines, and an oil port. Illinois leads the Midwest in crude oil refining capacity and was ranked fourth in the nation as of January 2013. In 2012, uh, Illinois ranked the second in the nation in recoverable coal reserves at producing mines. With a production capacity of 1.5 billion gallons per year, Illinois is a top Illinois producer of ethanol, and it ranked third in the United States in 2011. Illinois ranked first in the nation in 2013 for both in both generating capacity and electricity generation from nuclear power. Generation from its nuclear power accounted for over 12% of the nation's nu nuclear power. Additionally, Illinois households use 125 B BTUs of site energy per home, 44% more than the U.S. average. Lower utility rates compared to states with similar climate result and Illinois households spending only 2% more for energy in the U.S. than average, according to the e Environmental e Residential Energy Consumption Survey, which was, you know, at the time I was doing this, was updated in 2014. It was the source of the U.S. Energy Administration. The cost of construction, the amount of land use, transmission line costs, and other factors will make impractical wind as a replacement for fossil fuels anytime soon. What about coal? Well, the, we're, worldwide, we're burning our coal rate. And the thing is, we're our 8 billion tons a year for coal. We lose 22 million tons per day. This is going back again to 2014. We do burn about 250 tons a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I get my uh, PowerPoint to advance, Coal use in the U.S. is decreasing rapidly, but increasing elsewhere. One new major coal fire plant goes online per week in China. And 1,200 new coal power plants are currently planned worldwide. As soon as I get that. The toll from coal in a major study by the Clean Air Task Force meant that, uh, come on, 13,200 fatalities per year was estimated in the U.S. in 2010 due to fine particulate coal pollution, over 1,100 fatalities per month, 36 fatalities per day, down from 24,000 per year in a 2004 survey. And because we're using improved scrubber technology, the global death rate, however, is much higher, 1 million per year estimated. Coal is far better than nothing because without reliable electric power we would have half the third world we would have a third world standard of living in the united states electricity from coal saves far more lives than coal pollution takes you cannot afford to shut down coal email me um the information about your company <laughs> me all right janice uh can you yeah mute, you changed your email address so what i had wasn't working anymore i'll give you my email address later can you mute please if you don't mind i'll put my new email address oh, in okay in. let me take my pen because i just walked in the door okay i'm um, gonna mute you jan all right um we cannot afford to shut down coal or drive the cost way up with regulation until we have an economical replacement solar about 0.11 percent of the U.S. electric power in 2012 was from non-rooftop solar photovoltaic and thermal power. Solar power has a capacity factor of only 10 to 28 percent of its total output because of night clouds and etc. A solar farm of a one gigawatt average power takes 20 to 50 square miles of land. Huge amounts of raw materials like concrete and steel are needed to do this. Huge amounts of toxic chemicals are used. And those solar panels have to be replaced after 40 years. We're talking about 40 times the land use of a one gigawatt nuclear plant. It can be put on buildings and over parking lots. 
and uh, it's more expensive than coal and gas, a little more about that later on. Um, many utilities are forced to buy and pass along the cost of it because of subs, because they're, you know, have to take the roof, the top things in there. It's good for remote off grid sites, but not for large scale energy production. Yes, you do have uh, solar farms, but they always got to be backed up by a, by a peaker plant. Capacity factor. Capacity ratings for wind and solar can be misleading. Capacity factor is the ratio of average generated power to peak rated power. Um, wind capacity factors ranges from 15 to 40%, depending on what location wind consistency. Solar capacity ranges from 10 to 28%, depending on location and accounting for night, sun angle, clouds, dirt, et cetera. Nuclear capacity is well over 90%. Cost of energy conservation, Sunshine and wind are free, but conversion to electricity is expensive in terms of money, labor, land, raw materials, environmental degradation, and many other factors that come into the cost of building these things. Proponents emphasize the free part, but seldom mention the high conservation costs. The thing is, it's, it all boils down to dispatchable versus contingent power. Since load must be balanced on a continuous basis, units whose outputs can be varied to follow demand, dispatchable technologies generally have more value to a system than those whose operation is tied to an availability of an intermittent resource. US, from the US Energy Information Administration. Cost per kilowatt is not directly comparable between dispatchable and non-dispatchable sources, contingent or intermittent sources. Wind and solar are not dispatchable. Large scale energy storage is not yet efficient and economically practical. Wind and solar need near full capacity backup when the wind is not blowing or the sun not shining. Capital cost for wind and solar farms is in addition to the cost of a dispatchable backup plant. Backup capacity is less efficient with partial or rapidly varying load like a car and city traffic. For example, if you have like a, a natural gas plant, it's far more efficient to run in a steady state going up and down like you would be driving on an interstate in the country rather than the varying loads that you would see like when you're driving a car in a city where it's a constant stop and start, which is what would have to happen when you had intermittent solar and wind power. The uh, wind and solar need full capacity dispatch power source. Wind and solar reduce marginal fuel costs, but not the capital cost of the backup plant. So basically, what are we to do? I mean, renewables aren't going to cut it. And basically, I did have an epiphany, what I call the nuclear epiphany many years ago, which was learning about um, the nuclear power. Not so much the light water reactors, but uh, what we call th more thorium molten salt based reactors. There is an answer, whether it be fantastic or preposterous, it is. And I'd like to give special thanks to the authors whom I greatly got a lot of these PowerPoint sums, which was Robert Hardgraves, Thorium Cheaper Than Coal, Russ Papilli from the uh, his energy site, and Gordon McDowell on the list in within five minutes. That's the end of my formal presentation, but what I'm going to do now. Okay, go ahead. If you got a question, go ahead, George. Uh, well, we'll Thank take you a for that presentation. I, I very much appreciate it. Okay, um, well, it's it, it's still not over with yet because I got a little more material to cover. Oh, really? But there's two two broad points that I would raise. That's First fine. And foremost, um, again, there's the question of conservation. Right. In that, and and what's what's really salient about the question of conservation on the global scale. Uh -huh. is that American emissions, and we have, the United States has very high per capita emissions mm -hmm. relative to China. So yes, China has more absolute emissions, but on a per capita basis, we emit substantially more. That I and what is politically significant, politically salient, is that our emissions, again, are driven by luxury, driving SUVs, large cars, driving long distances due to urban sprawl, uh, McMansions, uh, single family homes that demand a great deal of energy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the argument would be that any rational energy policy would be a mix of conservation and clean renewable. Now I'm not rejecting, and, and I'm not reject rejecting nuclear, but I'm simply saying right. that that would be the front line mm -hmm. and that 
if the United States were to induce to in, pursue such policies, okay. that a global warming treaty could indeed be negotiated on that basis, uh, based on again an American policy designed to combat its excessive luxury-driven uh, emissions or energy use, again tied to to energy renewables. The right, other point I, I would raise to you. The okay. other point I would raise to you. George, that's a good point. Let me uh, get my presentation finished first, and then we're going to go into the question and answer period. But I really appreciate the points. Why don't you explain it up. the format? I have, Charlie. I was at the beginning of the thing. It's Let's part. It it's going to be the presenter presents. Then we have questions and answers, and then we'll go through it. I'm just going to very briefly Can't now. go through it again. Why All right. We explain? will have the presenter will present up to 45 minutes to an hour. Then we will have a question and answer period where we'll answer questions and have a little bit of open discussion on this stuff. And then we'll go into a rebuttal period where you have a chance to uh, say everything. So please just uh, keep keep around and we'll be more than happy to, to keep you in here. I hope we didn't lose you. Um, but again, uh, I really wish we could come in and, and, and say more and we're gonna have a plenty of time for discussion. So um, I'm gonna get now into what we call once I stop, I'm going to share some sc another screen here, and this is called uh, the Roadmap to Nowhere, and it was a presentation. Once I can get it up here real quick, um, this was a paper done by um, Mark. Can you see that now? By Mike Conley and Tim Mahoney. It was given in 2017. It was 100% clean, renewable wind, water, and sunlight, all energy sector roadmaps for the 50 United States. And it was done by Mark uh, Jacobson. And uh, he just basically said that we could make a world based on renewables by uh, in, in 50 years or more. The thing is, is that uh, the two presenters here that completely rebut him are not against renewable energy, but that the idea of renewables could actually power the entire nation, electricity, heating, industry, shipping, the works, and do it as well that we would need power plants that run an actual, we will still need power plants that run an actual fuel. You can't get there from here because extraordinary claims require or extraordinary evidence. In their view, the claim that the United States must less the entire world can be adequately powered by 100% renewable electricity is extraordinary indeed. The claim that we can have an all renewables grid with no backup from fuel power plants and practically no energy storage is even more than unnecessary. Is is even more extraordinary. To confirm or dispel our doubts, we ran the numbers on the industry's most highest regulated proposals, the Solutions Project 50 State Roadmap. Short answer, it's not a solution. A long answer follows. The Solutions Project is an environmental group with a bold vision to power the world with 100% renewable through an aggressive rollout of uh, wind, water, and solar with a simultaneous phase out of fossil fuels and nuclear things. The thing is, these uh, guys have done it. Their goal is laudable to create a clean environment by mid-century, but getting there is going to be far more problematic. They have, they outlined the roadmap here, and I'll put a link in the chat for it. But what they're basically saying is that uh, we're not going to get there from here. It's going to have to be um, done through nuclear power. And the best, and, and it's just, there's just all kinds of ways that they're not going to do it. In other words, bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that what we're going to need is we're going to, because of the amount of electricity demand coming up, the amount of uh, fossil, the amount that fossil fuels already take up, the amount of electricity we're going to need is not going to be generated by renewables. They've gone into great detail on it. And I'll put a link in the chat because they did do a, uh, they did do quite a bit of, um, you know, number crunching and, and things like that. I don't want to play it here because it is about a 20 minute long presentation. But if you look at a gap, uh, they're talking about, you know, yearly outlay and billions of dollars for the, you know, for the uh, grid system that might, that this out, that the author's proposing. And the thing is, we have to keep and make nuclear cheap again. And that is going to be in there. Now, nuclear power um, is there, but I'm going to stop the share on this because what I'm going to do now is basically outline 
uh, a little bit about what is happening in the nuclear power today. Um, a number of years ago, I'm sorry. A number of years ago, I learned about a power source uh, called fusion. And it was from a little talk that was given and I'm gonna pull a share screen again because I'm gonna go onto the web now. And it's gonna say F fission is the new fusion. And what it was, was that uh, if you go to the videos part of it, you'll see uh, quite a bit. And if you put in Google Tech Talk, um, You'll see the talk that I got um, in there. Should Google go nuclear? There's a whole bunch of things that come in here about fusion. Um, what has happened is that uh, fusion is always 20 years away. They're doing the tokamak design. They're doing it, but it's a very hard thing to throw atoms together to make them fuse and make power. It's a lot easier to do fission, which is what we're doing now with the present day light water reactor. The thing is, is that there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that can tell you a little bit about uh, what the newer types of reactors are. I'm gonna play a little bit of a presentation from Katie Hudak on uh, thorium and what she did on it. And uh, I think if I can just find it here, um, I have it on my other computer, but uh, Katie Hudak Thorium presentation. Uh, yeah, here we go. Jim, can I ask you a question now yes. or later? Go ahead and uh, if you have something, go ahead right now. I'm. I'm yeah, I, I'm just wondering um, if we were to use thorium as much as um, you want, if it were to replace what we have, mm -hmm. would we then eliminate? Uh, dams as we have them today, Hoover Dam and so forth? Um, it depends on how much power you put in and, and whatnot. I think it's going to be an all of the above deal to get off global warming. We're probably going to need a balance of renewables, nuclear power. Uh, we're also going to need wind and solar in there. So I'm not going to say that they're doing it. What I'm simply saying is that uh, renewables simply aren't going to cut it. Now I can go into a little bit more about the uh, about so, uh, so kind of a hybrid system. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, seeing as how I'm having a little trouble pulling up QDAC, and a lot of you guys already know what thorium reactors do. Uh, basically, what uh, the light water reactor basically takes uranium-235. They fuse it using control rods, and the way they cool it down is with high-pressure water. Mm -hmm which goes to about maybe uh, 50 atmospheres so they can increase the temperature, keep it at a liquid and use it as a moderator to disperse the heat from the reactor to the generators. It's a very inefficient way of doing nuclear power, but it was started by Admiral Rickover in the 1950s when they were doing nuclear submarines. And it's very safe when it's used at a small scale like nuclear submarines, but when you start scaling it up, You'll see all the containment problems and everything else. If you could design a reactor that runs with no at atmospheric pressure, which is what the molten salt reactor does, um, you'll you have a revolutionary power thing in there. I could get more into it, but the thing is, the thorium molten salt reactor uh, usually will give a lot more power. It's completely safe, and I think I'll throw up the uh, I. Wished I had more of these things in here. Um, I have to, I'll take another question while I'm getting into this next part of the presentation, but it's gonna be an all of the above strategy. Um, I had the roadmap to nowhere up and I need to find out a little bit of a thing. Uh, okay, bear with me for a minute. Um, anyway, but what, what, they, uh, what they call the uh, thorium based molten salt reactors, what they call a liquid fluoride thorium reactor or LFTR for short. What it does is because the nuclear fuel is mixed with the molten salt, the molten salt runs at a much higher temperature. They actually do the nuclear power, the liquid fission inside the molten salts. They then take it out and use the heat 
the heated molten salt, and then they go into the um, uh, basic uh, things. Now, Ken, you might, Carl, you might have to help me on this a little bit, but uh, I'm going to be very quick in saying that uh, if you look at it and you look through the Thorium Energy Alliance website, you'll find much more about the technology and what this is. This talk is more based on the power that we're in here. At this point, um, I think I made my point about electric power being displaced by nuclear. So I'm just going to conclude my, my uh, presentation now and start taking questions. All right, Kat, Carl, go ahead. So uh, briefly, uh, and, and to provide my credentials, uh, I have just about none. Uh, I have an atomic merit badge. I grew up around Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, I've been to that energy museum, and I have a pretty good science and engineering background. But my good friend Nick Turan is a PhD nuclear engineer and professional engineer, certified professional engineer. That means he gets to testify to governments and courts about engineering solutions. Uh, and so I listen to Nick. Uh, the basics of the thorium molten salt reactor is it uses salt as the coolant, it uses salt as the fuel, it uses graphite as the moderator. What the moderator does that makes your high octane fuel with no air more like something that has a proper air fuel mix. That's the function of the moderator. That moderator slows down the neutrons. So going from the chemical analogy to the nuclear physics, it slows down the neutrons so that the, um, so that the atoms can capture and fission. Thorium-232 uh, uh, will capture a neutron. It will become thorium-233. And over the course of a month, it decays into uranium-232, in which case it would be, uh, sorry, uranium-233, in which case it is fissile. It is, in fact, bomb material, and it would be a concern if not for all of the different radionuclides mixed in with it. It's incredibly difficult to separate those. Um, however, there's a lot of different contentions around how exactly to keep thorium non-proliferation safe. A great number of people think that it is one of the better solutions and one of the more proliferation resistant solutions out there. So that I think that's good enough that I got through the how the thorium turns into uranium and everything. Yeah, and the thing is, these the other thing is that they operate, they operate at a uh, atmospheric pressure, so you won't need all the mm -hmm. intense concrete and pressure vessels in there. I I don't know why I choked on not oh, going yeah. through the thorium reactor, but Ken, I really, Carl, I really appreciate you uh, helping out a little bit here. All right, since we're taking questions now, uh, George, you got one and uh, go ahead and give it to me now. I'm sorry I had to cut you oh. off a little earlier, but uh, thank you very much for respecting the uh, thing. So go ahead. No, thank you. I, I, you know, I misunderstood. I thought you'd open up the questions, but no, no, anyway, that's, th that's okay. Thank you. You know, one of just a, a little bit of history, just a little bit. Um, the United States championed nuclear energy in the 1950s and 1960s as an imperial strategy. The idea being that if its allies in Japan, in Europe, could get dependent on nuclear energy, the United States thought that it could dominate those countries' energy systems. You know, in other words, it could have something of a technology, of a, of the, of a technology monopoly on nuclear. And so again, these countries would be dependent on nuclear and, and then hence, again, further uh, tied into, if you will, the American Cold War effort. One of the greatest myths and lies of the current period is that the United States turned away from nuclear because of public opposition. That is simply factually untrue. The United States turned against nuclear energy because it lost any semblance of a nuclear monopoly. That last monopoly was enrichment, enriched uranium. Once it was clear that Europe and Japan were going to develop their own enrichment capacities, the United States turned away from nuclear precisely because nuclear opened the door to energy autonomy with regard to other countries. And the United States seeks to maintain global hegemony through the dominance of energy. So once nuclear posed a threat to America's hegemonic strategy of dominating the global system 
through the control of energy, the United States turned against nuclear and most specifically and importantly turned it away from plutonium. I mean, this is essentially the thesis of my book, uh, my latest book on global warming politics and energy, energy, the modern state and the American world system. So, you know, I appreciate that the, the, the focus on the technologies surrounding nuclear, but it's important to note that historically the United States has opposed any energy systems that it could not control. So the United States has historically been indifferent if not hostile to wind and solar. And again, the United States turned on nuclear uh, in the late seventies, precisely including plutonium, precisely because it could no longer control those energy systems. Indeed, the United States in 1978 passed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act. So the year before, Three Mile Island. So it's in that piece of legislation that the United States then globally uh, opposes uh, the United States champion countries adopting nuclear energy with the idea that the U.S. had a nuclear a monopoly on, the te on technologies surrounding nuclear. So, I mean, in the end, and in, in recently as 2012, uh, uh, the American government put out a blue ribbon commission panel, uh, again, further, again, advising against, arguing against uh, plutonium and arguing against nuclear precisely again, because plutonium and nuclear pose a threat to American global hegemonic strategies. So, I mean, we could talk about the United States abandonment of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, I can't remember, the, the, um, oh, Bar is it Barnwell? Can't remember after, and Clinch River. So again- Yeah, uh, the Clinch River plant that, that, that they had for yes. $8 billion at that- uh, Exactly, exactly. The United States turns they against those- the breeder reactor on. Once it was, exactly, the breeder reactor, thank you. Once it was, I gotta refresh my memory on my specifics. I'll refresh that's my memory fine, on my specifics. That's fine, that's fine, that's what we're here for. But the United States turns against plutonium once Germany- offered to sell the entire uh, nuclear fuel cycle, including plutonium, to Brazil. And so again, so once the United States lost control of this technology, that's what it turns against plutonium and nuclear. And so today, it is true, we are in the midst of a profound crisis, in part because we have no alternative technology. I mean, to an extent you're correct, Tim, we have no, no real alternative technologies to fossil fuels because the United States turned against nuclear and suppressed nuclear technology beginning in the late 70s, and indeed, even going to today. And again, the, new, the United States uh, ignored wind and solar. And even today, there's a really the question, is the United States really committed to wind and solar, or are these quote-unquote commitments simply symbolic? Well, I can give you an answer. Carol, you might want to help me on this a little bit. Um, there was something called the Molten Salt Reactor Program that was ran at Oak Ridge, Tennessee for many years during the 1960s. So the reactor technology has been proven out. And in 1972, it was canceled uh, because they said it wasn't economically viable or something like that. A congressman by the name of Chet Holyfield uh, recommended a cancellation of the Molten Salt Program. Um, but the thing is, is that in the last, uh, that a lot of that technology sat dormant in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, believe it or not, all that technology in the government papers sat dormant in the uh, children's museum in a closet until the Chinese came around about 2010 and basically read it all up. Now our Department of Energy has also co contributed a lot to China and they've had uh, team of scientists working to perfect this molten salt technology for quite a while and for the commercialization of molten salt reactors. I'm going to share my screen here real quick with something that Charlie has been saying that uh, there is no molten salt reactors under development. Well, Charlie, get a load of this because I think you're going to be flabbergasted once you see, uh, once I share my screen here with this, uh, with this stuff. Just in the last um, 24 hours, China began the first trials of the molten salt nuclear reactor using thorium instead of uranium. And uh, scientists in China are about to turn on for the first time an experimental reactor that's believed by some to be the holy grail of nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. uh, safer, cheaper, with less potential for weaponization. The U.S. abandoned thorium in favor of uranium as a fuel source in the early 1970s. 
The experimental prototype reactor in China's Gensu province is designed to have an output of just two megawatts. But the first commercial plants using the new technology are reportedly planned to come online in 2030. And uh, the thing is, Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of Oak Ridge, uh, started this program. We abandoned it, but China basically took it over. And they're uh, going to make China carbon neutral by uh, 2060. And one of the ways they're going to do this, they've effectively reactivated a research program that the U.S. mothballed back in the 60s. Who knows? Maybe in a different climate with some, some different economics, they could make it work. Thorium was named after the god, the god of Thor, and the radioactive ra waste from thorium only needs to be stored for about 500 years compared to several thousand for uranium. It is also more difficult, so on and so on. You can Google this article uh, by saying it. The thing is, it is happening. It is uh, coming online. There are several other companies out there that are making uh, uh, thorium-based molten salt reactors, including places like Thorcon. And if you've been to the, uh, if you've been to some of the um, thorium energy conferences, I remember talking to one guy who's making a nuclear reactor of the thorium-based thing, the size of a shipping container. And uh, there, Carl, I think you might know. Might know. Why does it take eight eight years to build one? Because Charlie, the thing is, is that uh, they're still working on the technology. They're saying they have commercial reactors widely available by 2030. Well, I actually finished. I, oh, yeah. I have huh. a bit of a response to that. Go ahead, Carl. Eight, eight, so eight years to the, get the um, first one online. If, if you don't mind, it would. Please, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the basics, of course, is that uh, any new nuclear project relies on experience and expertise of the workmen, of the engineers, and of the designers. So when you get to the point where uh, my father working on the uh, Ibasco with Ibasco on the Satsup plant, uh, him, uh, Pauls, Larry Pauls, and uh, John Simmons, both working at the Ibasco, for Ibasco at the Satsup plant, uh, they are retirement age now. And so when uh, Santee Cooper, uh, was there trying to build in South Carolina. The only expertise they had were these aged retiring engineers and an obstinate obstructionist NRC, Greg Yatsko, who's now selling solar and wind uh, to pay his bills. So uh, it, it is in fact true that uh, for the history of nuclear, uh, over the three false starts to the nuclear industry we've had, the first, when the AEC became the NRC. The second, after, um, after Three Mile Island. The third, after Chernobyl. Oh, and even the fourth, after Fukushima. Through those four false starts, we've had a great history of interrupted nuclear builds, of course. But uh, the latest, the great hope that we see is China. China is building, they're, they're breaking ground on a new nuclear plant every month mm -hmm. the united arab emirates has just put their second nuclear plant into criticality so that's baraka two baraka one was admittedly started over 11 years ago baraka two nine years ago baraka three and four they will have been completed the last one in less than six years and this is the first of a kind oh, problem pretty good, that's pretty good pace you know they're getting there <laughs> Yeah. What in the world are you building? Uh, but you know, building. global warming is coming. Have you picked I, up a newspaper lately? I have an idea. You're in Illinois, if I'm not you're mistaken. Gonna, you're going to get 10 years to get. And so I, I have, but I have an action you know, that you could take in um, 10 years to get one prototype in Illinois, which would put four are gigawatts of nuclear, four gigawatts that would go on the grid overnight. Go ahead, if Carl. anyone's familiar. We're going to change U.S. energy policy. Yeah, right. you absolutely can. It would be at a cost of between $5 and $15 per megawatt. It would be the zero emissions credit. It would mean that Byron and Dresden would stay online, and you have four gigawatts that would otherwise fall offline. That's the fastest way of building nuclear, is not shutting it down. That's right. 
Okay, uh, Karina, you got a question, please ask. Uh, the world supply of thorium, uh, is there gonna be a shortage? Who owns thorium? How much thorium does the United States have? Uh, is there gonna be a shortage of thorium? Is there one country hoarding up all the thorium? Uh, is it a rare, is thorium a rare earth mineral? Um, who, who controls the supply chain of thorium? Right now. Carl, you want to help me on this a little bit again, real quick? Uh, so I, I don't know uh, all of the supply chain, uh, but here's the very basic physical sciences is that uranium is about as plentiful as tin. Now, of course, that is uh, 90, um, not 99, it is uh, 99.8, no, 0.7% fertile, meaning that it is uh, fertile, not fizzle, and so we have to enrich it to get right. the last bit. Thorium is about three times as plentiful as the fertile uranium. Uh, and so that's, that's quite a bit of energy that you have available. Uh, the United States actually stopped mining uh, rare earth monazites because thorium comes up with those monazites and creates, a industri mm -hmm. Sorry, it creates an industrial me. waste problem. Uh, and so you'll, you'll have heard about uh, I think it's James Kennedy and the uh, Thorium Bank project. He's lobbying yeah. Congress to provide a strategic reserve of thorium so that uh, any thorium reactor we commence with would have a stable supply and it would help us reboot our rare earth man, uh, materials mining industry. Rare earths are those things you want for your, your renewable solar panels, your electric cars, for example, neomidnium magnets that are plentiful in your little earbuds are also rare earths. And uh, China right now has a monopoly on rare earths. The reason why they do is they went out, made them super cheap for a long time, bought up our rare earth mines. And then basically because it became uh, too expensive to mine our own rare earths, we were able to, to import them from China. So they now have a market on the corner of rare earths again. And uh, we're gonna need it. We're gonna need them if we're gonna be going into this thing. The thing is, thorium. Well, there is, is no current right now. There is no strategic reserve of thorium. That's why well, there's not. not. But you can pull it out. It would only take like one mine from the Lemley Pass, for example, to supply all of our thorium needs for for uh, the United States. You know, and it's 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 literally. Uh, dripping in those rare earth things. As a matter of fact, thorium tailings are one of the biggest problems they have with the, when they mine rare earths, they, it's classified as a nuclear material. So it has, but thorium actually is a lot safer than uh, you think you can hold it in your hand for a while and not get too radioactive with it. Put it in your shirt pocket, carry it around for a few hours. You're not gonna get that much radiation because the half-life of thorium is about the age of the universe. So, uh, you know. Anyway, um, I really, uh, really quick, uh, I want to say thank you so much for the presentation. I wish I could uh, hang out because I love uh, doing the debate, the, the Q&A, but uh, you'll have to wing it on your own, Tim. Sorry to say. Oh, no, I've no, got no. A thank show. you very much for showing me up. I mean, for, for talking to <laughs> me, not showing me up, but I mean, helping me out because I was freezing there for a little while on my presentation on the molten salt reactor yeah. in my presentation. You did great. You did great. And thank you, though, for coming. I really appreciate somebody from the Thorium, you know, from at least who's attended a previous Thorium conference. I think I remember you back at uh, 2012 talking to you a little bit. Uh, I still, 2019 would be the only one. Well, then I was there. I was the guy who uh, was hobbling because I twisted my ankle helping Gordon McDowell tape the first day. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. But I was kind of just hobbling there for a while. Anyway, yeah. thank you for joining us tonight. If you have to go, you have to go. Really appreciate your input tonight. Okay, who's got who's got the next question? All right, uh, question, John, John, and then we'll go to Tracy. First of all, isn't thorium man-made? No. When you're, no? No, it's it not. On the, bottom of the, the earth, uh, the heat of the earth is powered by the decay of thorium and uranium with the radiation that comes from the Earth's core. And that's what heats the Earth up in a lot of cases. So it's not like we're not getting benefits from it already. It's in the core of the Earth and the radioactive decay of thorium and uranium is what brings us the 
uh, Van Allen radiation belt and all the all the ways that the pro prohibits the solar wind from uh, taking away our atmosphere. So there's a lot more to it than that. As a matter of fact, um, when you look at it, thorium is very plentiful in the oh. world. Um, I know we have enough of this stuff that we could power the world for the next 5,000 years. And if we don't have it here, we can certainly get it from the moon fast enough. But uh, there's there's enough thorium around. Now, thorium, you have to remember, is a fertile fuel, not fizzle. Uranium's fizzle, which means you bombard it with a free neutron at fissions. Thorium, you have to put into a reactor, bombard it with free neutrons. It goes through a 28-day decay chain to denigrate to uranium U-233. And it's a U-233 that's the fertile fuel. So in a molten salt reactor, you have you introduce thorium into it and it converts itself to uranium-233. Now, uranium-233 is a lot more efficient than uranium-235 in um, getting the uh, result reactor. Uh, I can play a video that's about five minutes long and it, uh, it'll it give you lifter in five minutes. I mean, I can maybe do that at some point uh, during our uh, uh, presentation here, pending not too many... Uh, protestations from charlie uh but you know it does give a matter of fact i think i'll play that right now because it'll give you a really quick and good idea of what the thorium technology is i'll find it real quick here okay. i got a couple more questions too and go right ahead while, while i'm pulling this up go ahead and give you um, uh, correct me if i'm wrong i thought we got out of yeah. nuclear because it couldn't compete with coal unless you like canned all your safety protocols and then that's how the nuclear power stations have been shutting down. I didn't think it was politics. I thought it did, it, that you couldn't get investors to put into a nuclear power plant because coal was a better investment. Well, that might be partly true, but I also know too that our author here, um, who's wrote the book, I hope he's still here. Uh, I don't know if he's still here or not, but- uh, Coal production in the, in the United States is at the lowest level it's been since 1965. Because I don't, know, I don't know where Tim got his figures, but there's no demand for coal in the United States, or for that matter, the rest of the world. Because they've been using natural gas, Charlie, and a lot of the other countries. So your world. PowerPoint was based, your whole argument was based on coal. No, and it's, it's not. not being used. Charlie, coal production right now is uh, up dramatically in uh, the yeah. world. If you look no, at no, where? Come on, Tim. They ship. Can, I'll, let, I'll, I'll they prove it to you. Coal. All right. First, it's we're gonna. Close. All right. Before we get Charlie into it, quit causing trouble. There's no more. Uh, he oh, Charlie always causes trouble. No. So, who's got a, that? Okay. All so, the coal mines are closed. They're closing, Charlie, because we're starting to use more natural gas. And that's why. Which okay. I mean, the natural gas is even more of a better investment than nuclear. That's why. That's why I was. I yeah, had on right, there. right now it is because, you know, natural gas, the proven technology is a peaker plant, for example. The natural gas is used like a jet engine. They start it up and if they have to go up in power, they go up in power. If they go down, they go down in power. And it, right now, as far as fossil fuels are concerned, um, it is isn't less, it, well, natural it has, gas. Isn't that fracking? Uh, partly, they can also get oil from natural gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, natural gas can also be pulled from uh, oil deposits, There's, but fracking okay. is where they get you get a lot of it from. Because that's a lot worse for the ozone, or I mean, for global warming than. <laughs> Any other thing out there is that fracking. Well, the, only, the only thing is, is that if we're going to stop fracking and get off oil, we're going to need a low cost alternative. And the only way I see it is fracking's to... worse than oil for the environment. Well, the thing is, the only way I'm going to see getting off this stuff is through uh, the widespread application of these thorium reactors. Um, I'm going to play real quick a video that will explain a little bit more about thorium and the technology, real quick here. If Charlie will just let me share screen here and we'll. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll give, it'll be very quick. It's done by a guy from Kirk Sorensen. Uh, it was from, it, it was remixed by a gentleman by the name of Gordon McDowell, who 
has talked extensively about uh, about it. I got to share my screen here and get it up here so we can do this. Okay, I'm going to play this real quick when we get in here. And uh, the heavy water reactor will use about 0.7 percent of the uranium energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of one percent. They both do terrible. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run it over 70 atmospheres. It's only of five minutes they have long. To the water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. The number one accident people worry about: pressure is lost. Water that's being held 300 Celsius crashes to steam. Its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. If you don't get emergency coolant to the fuel in the reactor, it can overheat and melt. This is what drives the design of this building. So if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building. Now the reactors we have today use uranium oxide as a fuel. It's a ceramic material, chemically stable, but not very good at transferring heat. If you lose pressure, you lose your water, and soon your fuel will melt down and release the radioactive fission products within it. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. I mean, people sometimes say, is nuclear energy safe? And the first thing I say is, well, which one? Thousands of different ways to do nuclear energy. Is the car safe? Well, which one? I had the good fortune to learn about a different form of nuclear power, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. We can fully burn up the thorium in this reactor versus only burning up part of the uranium in a typical light water reactor. It's not based on water cooling, and it doesn't use solid fuel. It's based on fluoride salts as a nuclear fuel. You have to heat them up to about 400 degrees Celsius to get them to melt, but that's actually perfect for trying to generate power in a nuclear reactor. Here's the real magic. They don't have to operate at high pressure. They don't have to use water for coolant, and there's nothing in the reactor that's going to make a big change in density. Unlike the solid fuels that can melt down if you stop cooling them, these liquid fluoride fuels are already melted. In normal operation, you have a little piece of frozen salt that you've kept frozen by blowing cool gas over the outside of the pipe. If there's an emergency and you lose all the power to your nuclear power plant, the little blower stops blowing, the frozen plug of salt melts, and the liquid fluoride fuel inside the reactor drains out of the vessel through the line and into another tank called a drain tank. In water-cooled reactors, you generally have to provide power to the plant to keep the water circulating and to prevent a meltdown. But if you lose power to the lifter, it shuts itself down all by itself without human intervention. A staggeringly impressive level of safety, even if there's physical damage to the reactor. Thorium is a naturally occurring nuclear fuel that is four times more common in the Earth's crust than uranium. It's so energy dense that you can hold a lifetime supply of thorium energy in the palm of your hand. We could use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. Because the lifter is capable of almost completely releasing the energy in thorium, this reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery, but we can generate these liquid fuels from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from water, much like nature does. We can generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which could be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable and self-produced. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and we're not burning thorium. You know, some people who are kind of environmentalists, they say, listen, Nuclear power is not sustainable. We're going to run out of uranium. Okay, I will yield that point to you if we're talking about today's nuclear technology. In 2007, we used 5 billion tons of coal, 31 billion barrels of oil, and 5 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, along with 65,000 tons of uranium to produce the world's energy. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri. Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mind. It's a nice mountain, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave, Instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people.
thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. We will never run out. It is simply too common. There you go. Okay, and there you go. I'm going to stop the share of this thing real quick. But uh, I think you can kind of understand a little bit about what's going on with this stuff. So, you know, I hope that made things a little bit clearer about why I'm so gone on thorium. So, okay, next question, please. Yeah, one more. I got one more. Go ahead, Sean. Um, that, that actually, yeah, that is really cool, If that thorium. Um, I was going to get hired for the decommission of the nuclear power plant up in Zion, north of Chicago. Yes. And they had like millions of dollars set aside for it. It was all lined up. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't decommission it because um, you had to get permission from every city that you would rail it through, and there was no way of transporting it. So the burden of of this goes on. The investors leave basically, and a burden of decommissioning any nuclear power plant ends up in the town that it was in. And I find that to be incredibly wrong. And the fact that we can't decommission a nuclear power plant in America, I see as another serious issue. Good point, Sean. Um, who's got the next question? Thank you, Sean, for your contributions today. That's great. Uh, I'll ask one. Go Can ahead, I, Ellen. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at some articles on the negatives. Um, and I, I'm wondering, have you done much research on the pros and cons? I mean. You know, you've been studying this for a long time, and a few of the ones I see off the top is that it still can be made into bombs. Um, it's they, one guy says that it can't be, um, it's not that stable, it, you know, as an investment, it, they might as well stick with uranium. But, um, and uh, I guess, you know, I, I guess I'm just always wary of, you know, looking at this from a, it seems like it's a one-sided, you know, what are the, I don't know if I, you know, it seems like there is a climate change crisis coming. And um, I, you know, I was looking at the UN site on, you know, how are we gonna deal with this? I don't think we've even gotten back into the contract. So can you, have you done a review of the other side of the Yes, point? I have. As okay, a matter tell of me fact, more about that. As a matter of fact, I did uh, one of the conferences that I was at, on uh, the Thorium Energy Alliance, I asked a couple of physicists, is this uh, weapon, is it, can they make a bomb out of this? The answer is yes, they can make a bomb. But it's also a lot harder to make a bomb out of the spent uranium-233 because they're, it's uh, full of something called uranium-232, which is also very, uh, has a lot of cosmic rays and it's also hard to separate. So it would be a lot harder to make an atomic bomb out of this stuff. Now, there are ways of, of separating it. I mean, with any technology, uh, they can, um, you know, pull out the uranium-233. Uh, they can also go into it. But the thing is, is that uh, the amount of, uh, it would take a while to get the amount of bombs proliferation. They're much better off uh, enriching uranium to make a bomb rather than uh, using a liquid yeah. fluoride tell, reactor to do so. Can I, I, what I'm saying is to research it outside of the bubble of the Thorium yes. Alliance, you know, I mean, I'm I looking have. at what is, no, you're asking people at, in the Alliance to tell you the downside. They've got, they're only going to tell you the pro side, right? You know, you've no. got to really consider the opposite, you know, I mean, like, what does Jan say? And these, I mean, there's a lot of, oh, Jan, I know a lot that, of I UN people that are against everything nuclear. And I, I have a feeling they probably against this just as much. Oh, and of I, course they're I against also, it. Yeah, right. Well, that's what I'm saying. And I, why, uh, I mean, I, is there's validity, can you argue that side of the coin? I mean, is it dangerous? It's got a long half-life. I, mean, I just well, think the one thing, the one thing about, the, they have a lot of arguments when you're dealing with the light water reactor. There's a lot of waste involved with it that's put stored right now in parking lots. They don't have a repository for it. And the thing is only 3% of the waste is burned is actually burned off. 
we're going to need to answer the nuclear waste problem, which can be addressed through, uh, right. you know, reprocessing of fuels for different types of thorium reactors, or they can actually put it in and burn off the waste and get rid of the long acting nuclear actinides and everything else. Uh, the, what you would get in a thorium reactor, you'd still have to sequester some of that waste for 400 years, which I think we can do. And the other thing is nuclear waste is a type of pollution we want because it can be contained. It can be put into a cask. It can be stored and it can be recycled. And with the good, with the proper type of reactors, there's other things out there like the fast breeder, uh, some of the other things that, that can work, that can burn this stuff off. Now, as far as the uh, proliferation is concerned, yes, there's a proliferation risk. Um, yes, there is the danger of radiation because you are dealing with nuclear material. You're going to have a building about the size of a maybe a, a Best Buy or a Walmart, you know, and, and you're going to have thousands of them everywhere. And you're going to need to have security and you're going to need to have things like this. I'm not saying it's a panacea. Even Alvin Weinberg, the inventor, he first went on to invent the uh, helped invent the um, light water reactor. And his name was on the patent. Then in, in uh, when he did his initial research, on the molten salt reactor, he said, we're still going to need to have, uh, we're going to have to have institutions to which we're not accustomed, meaning that there's going to have to be security, there's going to have to be uh, things in there. But the thing is, that the lifter is so much more efficient, so much more proliferation resistant, uh, so much more safer than what we've got now, that it would probably be the best alternative to oil that we have well but you know so to me though what do you i used to work at people's energy studying right, this I know and, that. okay right and i see there's a job opening at the union of concerned scientists for an energy analyst and i'm like looking at it really as a concerned scientist i mean i think the problem with capitalism especially deregulated monopoly capitalism is that it tends to have a kind of military thought process, which is, you know, let's just sell this. I'm, you know, I've got this, I'm going to push this because I've got the patent on it and I've invented it. And it, it, you know, I'm just going to like, you know, get everybody else out of my way and just push it. And I, I just sense that that's kind of where this comes from. And I, I, I'm going to give an example. I've heard you talk about Gene Sharp is a great guy and it, Yes. And I watched a documentary and then I hear Max Blumenthal and this girl talk about that he really is a kind of propagandist that is a very dangerous out there. And I've been reading about the difference between propaganda and education. And, you know, if it's completely educationally, you know, there's one thing, but it seems that there's a propaganda that is not necessarily truthful. It just happens to be this guy's going to make a lot of money on it and they hire a lot of public relations people to push it. And they don't really consider, oh, well, I'm going to be dead by the time, you know, this problems arise or, you know, the whole world's going to die anyhow, but from global warming. And it seems like we need to use man's mind to really figure out question, how to stop yeah. global warming. And I, I guess, could you address that? All okay, right. That's I'll, it. I'll, I'll, how does I'll, it stop global warming? You know, I mean, Ellen, the I, thing is, is that, uh, there's a presentation, if you look at, I'll, I'll pull it up in chat, but there are, you know, like I said, the proliferation questions, the... Uh, the global those, warming question. I mean, will it solve the problem? Like, I, like Charlie I, said, I, 10 years, we're burned up. Look at Naomi Klein. Is it going to solve that problem? If not, we need to go back to the drawing board. Well, the thing is, what are you going to do in the meantime? You don't have any other technology. I know renewables aren't going to do it. And the thing is, is that I know, don't I disagree. There's wind farms right down there. And I, you know, I think if you updated your presentation to give I us accurate data from 2020 and, I you know, also, I mean, Trump brought I, that coal. I mean, we should have just made that illegal. And there's a, we need to question whether a lot of these things should just be illegal and then we would invest more people said when al gore was elected we probably would have renewables by now you know and that's probably why they didn't want him elected you know i mean if al gore i wonder what he thinks about have you if ever you looked look into al gore's the, uh, opinion on this 
Mm -hmm. If you look at the amount of land it would take to, uh, again, and it's precious the, metals. There's not enough precious metals to do use renewable for the globe. We, there's metals. way more oil. There's not yeah. enough precious metals for that. You would need, you would for, need, you, for wind farms and stuff. What people yeah, will be selling their rings, their wedding service. rings to retire if we use what? solar and wind. What about micro turbines? I've spent turbines. years researching little things you put in your closet wow. that weren't work on hydrogen or, and you know, there are technology alternatives that, you know, man's yeah. mind could come up with if it's in The thing is, you know, but you, you know, can't just push thorium because, you know, somebody's paying you to push thorium. There's a lot That's that can be said about conservation, yeah. which I think we all need to do. And I know in the United States, we do have a lot of luxury when it comes to uh, things. But again, I don't think it's going to stop electricity I, demand. It's going to it's going to help. Yes, look, I do. But, I agree with you that concert, I don't think demand side conservation is the answer. I don't think driving little cars is going to work or telling people not. to turn off their lights. It has to come from the supply side. And that has to be a regulation, oh, conscience-driven, okay. top-down decision okay, Ellen, of what to supply. Ellen, let's okay. wait for the review, okay? We're yeah. getting some people okay. losing again here. Okay. But uh, again, I'd like to... Uh, Tim, I'd like to ask something. Go right ahead, Charlie. Tim, if let's pick a year like 1800. If you ask someone, what does a railroad steam locomotive do? They would have to say, I don't know, not, they don't exist. How could I say confidently what one does or does not do? Uh, but I'm amazed that nowhere, the, uh, 10 years away from building the first thorium reactor, and yet you guys get together and confidently make pronouncements on what thorium reactors do or do not do and even make video this is amazing you even make a video in which the guy authoritatively says a non-existent device and he ex says what it does it does not do charlie I'm you forget you know, the thing is have you, have you even listened to the presentation charlie about the uh, molten salt experiment at Oak Ridge, where they actually had a reactor running for 6,000 hours. One? Why are you building one 10 years away? Because, Charlie, there was some, we stopped the research in 1972. A lot of it has to be uh, a new generation of nuclear scientists had to be trained up. They got 600 people working on it. And once you start building these things, they'll be built in shipyards. They can be widely deployed. Most of the reactors will be the size of a truck bed, and they could be widely used to help us stop the global warming problem. You guys, it wait is, a minute. You guys are you're the airplane before the Wright brothers flew. You guys are describing what airplanes do. Charlie, um, how do you do that? Charlie, there's a lot of research right now on the molten salt reactor. China's not the only country doing it right now. There was a lot of research on airplanes. Your comparison is not valid, Charlie. Why not? What do you mean, why? Why not? Your comparison is not valid, Charlie. There has already been a great deal of research that have been why? done on thorium reactors, and they're already being built. What do you mean they're being where? Didn't he the, just the tell you that they're, they're being built in China? The the thing is, it's just one it. thing from research to commercialization. The common source of amusement at the thorium conferences was that somebody would announce a reactor was being built. You know how many times that the, announced? That's not the only type of reactor that's being built. I'm going to present to you a thing from a company called Thorcon. I know, Timmy. You, how many announcements are there? Um, I'm going to show you the. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit about Thorcon. They're going to be. Uh, just tell me. Just tell me. If you don't know, 
Just say, I don't know. Charlie, I don't know how many other reactors are being built, but I do know well, there's other kinds. There's other there's kinds coming on the pipe. Yes, they're not. Like reader. Yes, there have there have not been an <laughs> endless number of announcements. There have Charlie, take a look. Go Google thorium reactors. Google, look at companies like Thorcon. Look at companies like Flybe Energy. Well, I've got to look. research and answer. You no, can't it's do. not a. I'll do it for bye you. Bye bye. I'll I'll do it for you. I'm going to pull up the website of one of the ones that's ready to build a, a different kind of reactor. It's not exactly the uh, thorium type of reactor. It's more of a uranium two thirty five reactor, but they're going to be building it the size of a ship. It's going to be using the molten salt technology, which can also be put into a uh, reactor and they're getting ready to build it now as a matter of fact they're uh right now working on a commercial application in malaysia to get it going a little bit more i'll share my screen here real quick with the thorcon website and what um, i have received personally from you emails that thorium reactors were being built and then we never hear them again didn't I just show you that china's building a reactor the one, the one up in canada there's another there's another <laughs> Canada, the, the thorium molten salt reactor is not online yet. They have a research reactor in Scandinavia. There's another one going in China. Um, they're getting, they haven't been commercialized yet, but they're very coming close. This Thorcon this is, is probably. Many can't turn it on. Charlie, they've already done research on the molten salt reactor. It's been proven in Oak Ridge. Nobody's built one yet for commercialization. They are coming fairly soon, okay? And what you may not understand is that, uh, you know, this most of the technology for the molten salt reactor was pioneered and done in the 1960s at Oak Ridge, Tennessee by a gentleman by the name of Alvin Weinberg. And Alvin Weinberg was also one of the first nuclear scientists to go before the congressional committee and talk about the dangers of the light water reactor. He also talked about uh, one of the first scientists in the early 70s to uh, talk about the um, emergence of global warming. And as you can see- I, I, I got a question here and I'm not a businessman, but I've got to wonder about why you think the United States should invest its energy resources in a technology which quote, isn't commercially ready or available because it no can be within what. a few years and it can be widely deployed oh, that's why years. probably less than five if we went on a manhattan project type thing in here so that's like asking the guy in 1800 uh when will the steam engine be developed and you got to remember it was less than 30 years when the steam engine was developed and within a generation <laughs> or less it was widely well, deployed <laughs> They had steam engines in the 1800s. They didn't have the uh, part of it out yet. But the thing is, Charlie, again, it's a different ball game because we know what we already have seen one of them built, one of them running for 6,000 hours. You cannot make an assertion. It's called an assertion, Tim. I'll leave it at that. I I'm, think you're I'd absolutely like wrong, Charlie. Add to that is that, you know, you use the analogy, the Manhattan Project, and then you, it comes out of Oak Ridge, which is where, you know, the, the Nazis developed the atom bomb. Basically, you know, anything that comes out of Oak Ridge is probably a Cold War military. I'm going to be back. So in why are we I can hear you. I'm going to be Manhattan back in a minute while project I get more is our model. We don't, we need to be a more sustainable, you know, think green. All of these other things, I think, are alternatives that, you know, I've, we've got to stop this new cold war you know i mean the cold war's over it never made any sense and so we shouldn't be you know doing everything on this military model you know of bombs and things you know and that and it's really be, all being done it, in a military it is a bomb model. type of thing and that's that's dangerous i mean and as this guy said before like it's a oh, false shit. start the the, the Japanese is a false start. I mean, that's a disaster. You know, I mean, all of the things are disasters and say, stop it. You know, don't uh, do that anymore. It's not safe. Thing, it doesn't have a half life. I don't know how many is, Ellen, when you consider. take a look at some of the disasters that have been happening with fossil fuels around the world that we don't normally hear about. 
Well, forget no. fossil fuels and go to these these non these renewables. You know, just go to the renewables. Why not? No, just uh, because them. basically, be when we run out of rare been done metals, a long time ago. And the thing is, when you talk about the land use alone, we're talking a lot. Of they stuff. can develop the efficiency and actually the efficiency yeah. of this. You know, don't just like everything is a nail. You know, I've got this and everything's a nail. Are a good part of what our energy mix is going to be, but they're not going to replace the full Look, amount of electricity that we've Forget done. Oak Ridge and the and the Cold War, you know, Manhattan well, we're, Project. We're, 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 we're forgetting about it now because there are investors in American companies like Thorcon, like Fire Energy. Better like a lot of others right now that are doing it if you just google this stuff you'll see exactly what i'm talking about yeah um, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit here and say oh this military mindset the thing is the world the best quote i ever heard about it was in a guy who wrote a book and i'll show you the book here real quick on uh when i share <laughs> screen real quick again it's gonna be uh let's see richard martin he wrote a book, and this was back in um, 2017, I mean 2010, and it was called uh, Super Fuel, the Green Energy Source for the Future. Um, let me take and chances are it was propaganda that he was oh, paid to write. Really? That's what I'm seeing. You know, right, there's a pattern the, of... Here's the uh, book. They don't wrote. tell you the negatives of something, uh, you know. He does. And a lot of a lot of the negatives from you know, like I said, it's nuclear power. Who it's is Richard Martin? Age. What's his background? Yeah, but he, is, I mean, uh, he doesn't have any uh, lobbyists. Richard or... Martin was a he wrote. If you take a look here, um, he talks about it. But his background is he was a. Uh, I'll Google his name real quick because he is an author and he is worked for Wired magazine for a while and he did a lot of. Uh, Various things. I'll, I'll show you real quick here. Right. A, a lot of uh, articles are written by, you know, for capitalists, like uh, propaganda hey, more than anything. Hey, Tim, can I show my PowerPoint? Go, yeah, Charlie, go, go, go ahead and show it, Charlie, if you want. Um, All right. If you want to show your PowerPoint now and rebut me, uh, go right ahead. I know you got something in the, in, in, the, in, in ready to go. So, uh, if you guys don't mind, we're going to let Charlie go for a few minutes here. Sounds good. I'd like to see it. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right, this is a real quick one, folks. Only a few minutes. Uh, what I've spoken on this to uh, NEIS, anyhow, does it show up on the screen okay? Yes, it does, Charlie. We got it. Okay, elements of life in a nuclear world. Just a few observations. In the United States, we're all familiar with Three Mile Island. I actually lived not terribly far from there. Not, I had already moved away, but uh, we did have a very serious mm -hmm. incident here right in the United States. We had very direct, immediate experience with this technology uh, that's not going to be dismissed. Uh, I also like to point out that a lot of people, one of the reasons Three Mile Island is an issue, a lot of people don't know the locale, but it is situated on the Susquehanna River, which is the major, largest river on the east coast of the United States, and it's 444 miles wide. So if you want to make, the amazing thing is other reactors are Similarly, well, I've seen the one on the Hudson River, north of New York City. Uh, that would be great, great to have the Hudson River uh, polluted in some fashion. We'll see, which can happen. Uh, here's an idea of what a nuclear installation looks like. Uh, it involves some serious, serious technology, so you can understand why it takes 10 years to build one of these things. Uh, here we go, just a little picture here uh, of Fukushima. And this would could be happen here. I don't know if your local fire department could put that out, but uh, what village, whatever. Yeah, uh, Batavia is a 
where the reactors are. Uh, you think the Batavia Fire Department could handle that? Okay, now there's a looking at here's what happened in Fukushima. I'm a railroad guy, so there's the track commuter rail that you used to have in Fukushima, and there on the bottom and uh, right is what it looks like today. Uh, is this the future that you want? Okay. Uh, here's one about my friend Yuji. He had a contest for the town slogan for Fukushima, atomic energy for the destructive future. There you see him there and what's left of the community. Uh, there was another one there, of course. I'm a railroad guy. Here's the, if you'd like, you can go to the Chernobyl Railroad Station. There's not a lot of passengers these days because the last train was in 1986. Uh, one of the things I haven't heard tonight, but to usually hear from the Thorium boys, is that, oh, don't be afraid of radiation. It's all over the place. And Thorium is this and that and half-lights and so forth. But this is dangerous stuff. One micro dot of radioactive materials can be lethal. This is not stuff you want to muck around with. It is the purest form of pollution. Now, do you think we should have a method for producing the most lethal form of pollution? I got to say, perhaps maybe we ought to rethink this. And also, it seems to be a real fun substance. If Fukushima reading is even becoming more dangerous, but less. This is amazing. Uh, but yeah, they're having some real issues of even doing anything at all to correct the situation there. Now, the thing I focus on mostly that I know about is shipping nuke juice around the United States. They want to do better, and they'll tell you, oh, don't worry, Charlie, we got these real nice containers. No problem. We'll see this later. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, that there'll be about, it'll take about 10,000 train shipments of this dangerous waste over 24 years just to move it someplace that we want to dispose of it. Uh, about 100,000 tons of nuclear waste. Oh boy, this is this is an environmental solution. A hundred thousand tons of <laughs> deadly high-level waste, and this is an ecolog. Do you come to the ecological people and say this is what I want to do? I'd say, well, I, whoa, whoa, never mind. That's what it looks like. The radiant heat. This stuff is hot. It's about six five hundred degrees. Oh. <laughs> It doesn't cool down. This is a, okay. Now, here's the thing about if you're living in Chicago and Illinois, you can go. We're the railroad capital of the United States. So, any one of 47 railroads could be carrying this juice. And while you're at it, there are about 25 junctions where railroads cross. And guess what? On occasion, railroad, two railroads want to cross at the same spot at the same time. Now, mixed in the Chicago area are passenger trains with about 760. Do you want to mix all this traffic together uh, in one place? And it's going to go without no incident whatsoever, right? This is what happened when real locomotives collide. You get fires. They're under normal circumstances, but you want to add some nuclear juice to the equation here. Here's some of the way they ship it. Uh, there's various methods used around the world. I like this one. This is a standard gondola car used for scrap metal. No, they did put a lid on it. So I guess that's a safety measure. And I like this one down here. That's a normal waste, like garbage. For East Coast, they do that. They ship their waste products by rail to dump sites. They put it right in regular containers. Uh, so that's what I mean. Here's a little picture here of what these waste sites look like. 
oh, this should be no problem. Just bury it and don't worry about it. <laughs> Somebody else's problem, right? Oh, now there's also liquid stuff. Fukushima, a million tons of radioactive water they dumped into the ocean. Hey, no problem. And look at here's the waste that they're gathered from Fukushima in bags. Look at the size of these stacks of them. And look at this. What do you do? This is what you want. You want a cre creative, creative process. No problem. Where do you think to do with this? Now, this one I like, one of my favorite. We all, oh, this is, don't worry, this is technology here. But how would you like if it was announced on the news that an experimental nuclear reactor, thorium reactor, will be turned on tomorrow for the first time in the town where you live? So, oh, no, no big deal. It'll probably all work well. Now, I heard a little bit about fusion. This is a, I won't get into this. This is, this is just one inkling of what this science fiction stuff is where they're at right now. And we're talking about this should be, oh, no problem. Tim is saying this is a matter of days until we get this operational or commercially operational. 20 years down. I didn't say anything okay, about Okay, now let's look what's going on in Illinois. We have to look back in the past and let's see what our experience has been. But they want $6 billion for dangerously degraded old reactors. Two, two of them in Illinois. So this is the gift that keeps on giving. Okay, now there are people of, uh, with some degree measure of sanity that come along and say, we have Green New Deal. And there is all kinds of technology, but the simple ones that don't have any real issues, like the light bulb thing. And they, they try to encapsulate these in the Green New Deal, with what I present to the members of Congress. Now, you re not only do they want a piecemeal piece of equipment, but we have to think about in the larger scale that we want to transform our solidarity economy. Uh, this is people with a bit more foresight uh, and thinking beyond what exactly, you know, we want to transform the, the nation and in terms of this energy policy. And we can do it in a positive way. If you want more information specifically regarding the Green New Deal, please go to our lecture library and you can see a talk that I gave uh, on what is the Green New Deal. It's in the lecture library. So you can go back and reference that. Just go to the main website. This is the kind of world that we're looking for, one compatible that we have a pleasant place for families to live uh, and not just this kind of scheme and whatnot. Quickly, I almost done. Uh, first large scale wind farm uh, is they're looking. This is where the, the technology is at in this regard. Um, and this turbine could give your household all its meat in seven seconds. That's pretty, that's, that's a lot of energy very quickly. You get a couple of these off the shelf technology ready to go. Here are some schemes. This is an enormous one but hey it's doable instead of these reactors you could do this tomorrow start construction on it and guess what it would be operational by the time you put the last bolt in place oh i always like this from trump we had his energy policy he didn't like renewables too much so much so that for some reason he even claimed yeah, wind turbine noise causes cancer. Today, no one knows precisely how, but he ran around the United States telling people this. Uh, last of all, the other thing about, you saw this gigantic technology 
get a renewable feature that's a little bit different. They're becoming more like appliances that households, each small households can afford, and even in the third world countries. So people even in a, 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 a poor country can have the benefits of a fan to cool off. This is, this is right now available. You can go out and buy the, you can go on the internet and buy one of these. That uh, this is the alternative that we're given, nuclear reactors, which has to be the most inconceivably expensive and complex method ever came up of boiling water. That's what it is. See, there's water in there. But if this is what you think the direction we should add, uh, hey, join the Thorium boys. Now, the young people don't seem to have bought into this. And they seem to have a different opinion. Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement, they seem to be on my side on this issue. And if you want new information, go to Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog, NEIS, Nuclear Energy Information Service. And there you go. Thank you very much, folks. That was, hope you got something out of it. <clears throat> All right, Charlie, go ahead and unshare your screen. All right. Uh, right. All right. I'll. Uh, I'd like to add. I like you know Charlie's point of view is that good other side of the coin, and it, one, one it made me also think of the issue of uh, hey, there's Charlie, a documentary. I'm going to stop you, gonna stop on you the, sharing. On the World Trade Organization. Okay, just hold on. And on how they responded or did not respond because of capitalism to the nuclear the Fuku some uh, nuclear reaction and capitalism is not a you know you can't it, it blocked it i mean what they do is cover up the public relations people say pretend it didn't happen there's no problem there you know cover it all up this is what we see and but that that is blacked out in the media the other side of the coin the dangers of it that's what public relations is and we you know that's why we've got disasters because there's no regulation of misinformation about critical public policy issues. You've got BBC and Fox News and NPR all telling uh, the capitalist side of the story. And um, you know that's dangerous, scary stuff. And also politicians have to sign a thing that I will not vote for environmental things. That's like the contract with America, but that's what they do. They sign an oath not to protect the environment. And that has to be exposed and stopped, but it's covered up. Okay, that's all I got. Well, what do you got to say? Okay, Charlie, I will concede the points to Charlie that what he's talking about with the last three nuclear disasters are with the light water reactors. And the light water reactor has a has a feasibility risk all those things were because of a problem with the coolant at a large high pressure reactor and <laughs> the, the thing is is that when you get with something at atmospheric pressure you're not going to have these kind of disasters because if you use a liquid fluoride kind of reactor the uh you have to keep the reaction going and if it uh, you lose all power there's a little drain tank that the stuff goes into and just becomes very passive. I am not going to acknowledge that Charlie is absolutely right about the nuclear disasters that we saw at the Three Mile Island, um, that we also saw at uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl. But if you understand, Chernobyl had no cooling towers. How it do you drive a steam turbine without pressure, high pressure? Uh, Charlie, the thing is, is that... Uh, you How know, do you do that? You have, Charlie, with the molten salts, you can handle the pressure. How do you the, do move a big turbine? I've seen them in dams. How do you move that? cycle, Charlie, one thing. You got to move like 10 of them. They're as big as a house. Charlie, you know, there's going to be some pressure involved with the molten salts. How do you move the pipes. blades? Charlie, I'm not going to get into it with you because you and the NEIS um, uh, 
the NEIS is completely wrong about a lot of the stuff that's going on. If you really look at the what the Jim, there's a lot of experience in steam locomotives with steam under high pressure. Yes, I know there is. It's doing the same thing. Exactly the same thing as a steam locomotive. Well, we're going to, you know, the thing is, Charlie. You tell me you got the problem solved? With a molten salt reactor, uh, you're going to have, yes, you're going to have some high pressure uh, molten salt going through some loops in pipes and things. There might. Um, mm -hmm. yes. I'm sorry, but did you see the movie of um, the one in Russia, the Ukraine there? You know, the problem is the human factor. You know, the guys never accepted responsibility for what was going on because of politics and bureaucracy. You can't just assume that, you know, you build Frankenstein and it's got salt in it, so it won't be a problem. You know, I mean, that you've got people whose job is to cover up, deny everything. And, and that's the danger. I don't think, I, I think you're absolutely wrong, Ellen, because I know this technology's well, a lot safer. It can't be made into a bomb, okay? And there's maniacs that will go get a bomb, just like they're gonna use bio warfare and germ warfare to create a virus so they can make money on a vaccine. You can't underestimate the psychopath factor in this day and age. If you study history, you see what the Cold War is. Your genie is out of the bottle. And this if world beyond we, war will never get to. That's all. If I got. we don't exploit this technology, the Chinese will. They'll be able to license these reactors around the world because they will be practical. They will be a replacement for oil. And yes, they some of the stuff's inherently dangerous. But the nuclear power industry, when you call it on a death per kilowatt basis, there's been virtually no deaths in the nuclear power industry and i can prove it by statistics if you want well, to go there. in this century i mean i just i don't know there's there's just a lack Ellen, of um, if you want a, a large scale prosperous society that uses power we're going to have to use i want a regulated power. one i want capitalism to be regulated i don't want to be run by one stock market exxon and dupont and you know the the Dow Jones Industrial Complex, they will profit and the rest of us are going to get killed off because that's part of their plan is to have us all killed off and they'll live, you know, and that's the reality of the crown and the safari club and Kissinger and the whole neoliberal movement. And, you know, so you, you just, if we don't stop that engine of death, that's the problem, you know, so, and it just is, crazy the way people like Al, like Gene Sharp and, and anything that is pushed by these guys, they've got a motive. And you got to stop and question it and get everybody else to question it. Like in Charlie's presentation is, is very good in that regard. <laughs> you know, and it, you. you know, the salts and all that stuff, nobody's following that, but it, you know, it's, Nobody. I, I'm sure that could be made between, do you have electricity versus gas versus this? And you got to look at, you know, they deregulated everything. And why? Because they wanted to, they wanted to, you know, profit off of death, you know, and that's, that's the problem. We have to re-regulate and just have a regulated safe things, you know, <laughs> it's scary, but uh, deregulation has gone so far. All we have to do is restore and also the, the, one over the stock market because right now they're just going to invest in propaganda and lies and public relations and it, it's like you know in the news oh no law against it you know interstate commerce commission federal commerce commission and they're just it's all propaganda no truth you know that's what we've got and they're like oh that's free speech you know if we've got to really think scientifically and critically about what this Deep state. Do you it's understand different. what capitalism's all about, Ellen? Do you really understand capitalism, what it's all about? I got a three minute video here that's going to explain it real quick. It's from Elmer Fudd. And I think it's going to really show you what 
capitalism is and what it, what it does and the benefits that we make from it. Charlie, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen on this real quick. It's called Elmer Fudd on Capitalism. And I think you're gonna like it in a minute here. Can you see the screen? Okay, here we go. Will somebody explain why the elves have returned yet? But I want to stay in business. How can I do it? Business? Well, let me explain it this way. A manufacturer who sticks to old equipment cannot compete and must fail to survive. He must persuade people to risk savings in his business. He can then buy new equipment, increase production, and show a profit. And he keeps the profit. Oh, no. That's what a lot of people think. But he doesn't. Out of profit, he must pay dividends to investors. Profit must be put back into the business to buy newer and better machinery. It's profit on machinery. When does it all end? It never ends. Constant replacement with the weightless machinery makes the industry more efficient thus enabling it to pay higher wages and still make a profit. This efficient operation also results in more goods of better quality and produces them at a lower cost to everyone. By thunder, if that's the way it's done, I'll do it. Now watch, Sylvester, and pay attention. Fifty years ago, the standard of living was low. People worked long hours for little pay. But because people's savings were used to back good ideas and industry plowed back earnings, new products appeared. More efficient industries made more jobs and higher wages, and shorter working hours to enjoy the higher standard of living. Hey, uh, that figures, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure does. So, without the use of savings for capital investment, there would be no new industries, no new jobs, no improvement in products, and no progress. That's basically capitalism. Yeah, that that's the ideal. That's the Adam Smith story. You know, look at what monopoly right, capitalism is. And that's fascism. Get, fascist trying get, economics. Trying to get this taken care of. I'm stopping it now. I'm trying to get this thing stopped. How can I do it? Business? What? There we go. You still there? Yeah. There's okay. fascist economics is when it's the monopoly power of the corporation controls the government and it doesn't care what the people think, how they vote, what they want, that they want a lifelong planet, that they, they want a government they can trust. Government, if, if you've got unregulated, completely monopoly political capitalism, that is fascism. And that is what, you know, they're like, okay, I'm just going to blow everybody up and you know and that is exactly what look at what they did in Hitler Germany and it looks a lot like today 
watch Babylon Berlin and you see what it's like oh. to live under that. And that's, we financed that and we are exactly like that. This is like the Fourth Reich and it's right. got to be stopped. I'm going to ask Bob Matter to help me on this. Do you have something to yeah. say, Bob? I guess maybe he doesn't. Well, are we in rebuttals right now? We're, we're going to be going to rebuttals in a minute, but we're, oh. I'm asking you to help answer my question under Ellen's uh, diatribe on capitalism right now. Oh. No, what we have is we live, we live under socialism. And you can tell by the way our society looks, it's starting to look like all socialist cultures. You have the elite managerial class at the top living high on the hog like Nancy Pelosi and her big fundraiser the other day. They're all sitting there, all rich white people uh you know drinking fancy wine in california being served by masked uh you know young immigrants uh you got the bit people that do the work in the country barely getting by and then you have the 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 rich elites you know living living high on the hog and then the, the real poor people the, the rich elites have just they're keeping them comfortably numb with uh, all these uh, stimulus payments and unemployment checks and all kinds of other gimmies so, so they can, you know, that kind of just keeps them subdued. And then meanwhile, they're just extracting taxes out of those of us in the middle. And then of course the, the you know, the ruling elites live high on the hog on the top. The uh, lower classes are kept uh, happy by their guaranteed uh, income checks that they're getting all the time. The rest of us are footing the bill. So uh, but they're about to cut off right easy. now, right? These yeah, chicks. Really, very, very, they're very little, limited. Very little real capitalism uh, heart left anymore. I agree with that. You know, right. that's the thing is, I tend to agree with them a little bit more. We have what we call a monopoly, like Adam Smith railed and warned against in a lot of cases. But mm -hmm. I also think, too, that maybe perhaps uh, we did it once before when we broke up Standard Oil and some of the other trusts in the 1910s and 1920s. And we're probably we, going to be seeing that a lot again here soon. We didn't really break them up. And, it, you know, at and I mean, you can talk about that, but they weren't really broken up. And now you've got, as, I'd like to hear what Tracy says, but the, you know, the Carlisle and DuPont, that we are, you know, all of this, all right. War economy works together, basically, you know, like a, a military, you know, takeover of the world. Half of our, our national income goes, you know, 27 trillion in debt to the war economy. And, you know, that's, I mean, ideally you could have had, you know, okay, you know, the military really cares about the planet, but it, it, that's not the way what we have really is fascism. Just consider it rather than capitalism. I like Adam Smith capitalism. That's not what we have because, and he, he and Milton Friedman and all these guys warned about this stuff. This is not, this is libertarian. This is beyond any politics. This just happens to be kind of, well, it's sociology I, and they want to ignore the sociology facts on the ground and just have, let's do it all from the corporate you know, side corporate benefits, it'll trickle down. It the Reagan put it in in '81, and it hasn't, it hadn't panned out. But we can't it get the corporations to ever admit that they've become a monster. You know, big corporations are hurting business and middle small business. One fourth of them are gone now. You know why? I mean, it, there's uh, they're like it's all warfare, nuclear warfare, atomic warfare, chemical warfare. That that's the pharmaceuticals. You know, we've got big corporate monsters, and that. Adam Smith said, regulate them or, or you know, do put them in jail, as Kevin Barrett said today about what's really going on with, you know, war. They're going to keep us at forever war. And that's the whole, but there's a lot of money in it for them. Like pharmaceuticals, share, nuclear I bombs. just don't share your doom and gloom of the world. I think we're progressing. I, I want to save it. I just want to say, let's just re-regulate it. That's all. And so that you have scientists right. looking at, at policies well, and then capitalism can do what capitalism does rather than cap. It's all capitalism and no, no social I, contract, no, no concern about the demand, about the consumers, about the population starving and bombing. Like, 
like uh, Naomi Klein and, and Andy Anderson would talk about and, and Jan and all these people. I mean, they're not just saying this for the fun of it. They're like warning us, and but okay. nobody can hear us because they're blacked out. All right. I think now it's time yeah. to uh, go into rebuttals because I could go on and on about this stuff. Um, Ellen, I think you've just uh, given your first rebuttal, but I'll let you go again in a second round. Who's got rebuttals tonight? Charlie, I know you have one. Uh, Ellen, okay, go ahead, Bob, and let's just... Uh, well, uh, it's 8.21. I'll give you guys about six minutes apiece, or if you want to go a little longer, we can understand that. You want to share a screen or whatever, now is your time. Well, uh, I'll get the last word, of course. Okay, well, Tim, I think it was, uh, I think it was a good presentation. I, I, I'm totally on board with nuclear power, whether it's thorium or any other kind. I'm, I'm all in favor of it. I mean, this is what we have to do to you know, produce the power we need without the emissions. And it's, there's, there's really no other viable alternative. Uh, this green movement, this Green New Deal and all this stuff, this is just, this is a religious movement just for, for utopia, not based in, in any scientific thinking. These people on the left, it's, it's not science, it's emotion. This is, this is a religion. This is the woke religion of the left. And they're dabbling in everything in, in you know, race theory and, you know, in energy, you know, and economics, things they know nothing about. You're looking at people that think that trans women are women. They're, they're the, that's, what, that's the type of my, scientific minds you want deciding about our nuclear energy policy. Not, not me. Uh, so the thing is, the, the school system was taken over decades ago by Marxists. And little, our children have had, you know, hammered in their heads to hate America, that America is bad. You know, we're, we're, we're just a racist, fascist, you know, right wing, white supremacist you know, oppressor, you know, of the world's people, blah, blah, blah. So this is pounded in their head. What's also pounded has been pounded in their head is that, you know, nuclear is bad, right? And we had, we had those, you know, few accidents that happened in, over time and to, you know, to the, that use, they use as talking points, you know, and they keep hammering this in. So the, the left, you know, the, 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 these children now have grown up and they know the narrative. And it's, when you say nuclear power, they just automatically blurt out the narrative. Nuclear is bad. Of course, they have no idea if it's really bad or not. That's just a narrative because they've never been taught science. They don't have any understanding of science. They're, they're being taught all this sociology nonsense, you know, gender studies majors and things like that or whatever. What AOC, what, was, what is her major? I don't know. She used to be a barista before she became a congresswoman. She's, she's a, a child. She doesn't know anything. Uh, especially anything about energy policy or economics. And here she is, you know, touting the Green New Deal and everything all over the place. So I think what we need to do, you know, first we're, we have to change the political system to get, you know, a, a, a party in power that is rational and scientific in thinking and will do the rational scientific things, which is nuclear power. But we have to, so we have to have that party in place. This this is a long, you know this is going to be a long a long a long haul. Uh, like I said, the, the left has has captured the schoolrooms. They've they've had decades to indoctrinate and brainwash uh, children. Of course, the media is just uh, for the most part you know the major media. Those are just um, you know propaganda arms of the DNC. And uh, so one good thing that may have come out of the pandemic is that you know people are homeschooling more and now with the left's crazy idea with these you know masking people for christ's sakes the in indiana the uh uh the number of double vaxxed people that have died from a breakthrough infection is less than a quarter of a percent and yet we're still being forced to wear masks you know on the train and the 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 rate the rates are similar even across the border in Illinois. They're not quite as good as Indiana's, but but they're quite similar. Uh, you know, like around a 
third of a percent chance of being hospitalized and about a quarter of a percent chance of death, you know, something like that. Very similar uh, rates. And again, over there, they, everybody has to wear a mask, you know, indoors, regardless of your vaccine status. And it's just crazy. It's that it's not the people with it's not the double vaccinated people that have been uh, getting sick and dying of COVID. It's the unvaccinated people. So why should we have to wear, you know, masks? And uh, um, but anyway, so anyway, but uh, I digress. But you see that we do not have people that respect or know science in power. This is all theater. Uh, this is all about a power grab by the elites at the top. Uh, you know, they are not qualified to be making decisions on nuclear energy or anything else. And I said, we need to recapture our system, our political system, uh, and get rid of these, uh, you know, Marxist leftists that are, have been, you know, implanted everywhere. That's, I don't, I'm not certain how we're going to do it. Uh, because, you know, look at the, look, you know, Biden is bringing in 150,000 illegal aliens per month coming in through the border that he's then quietly busing and, and flying to uh, swing states to, you know, beef up the Democratic vote for the, you know, the, just the future. Those are, those are un, undocumented uh, Democrats, as they say. And, uh, you know, how these people might be carrying COVID. We don't know what their psychological background is. But look at the stress and strain that alone is putting on our on our energy requirements, you know, 150,000 people a month. That's a, that's a good sized city basically coming in every month. That's just the ones we know about. That's the one, that's the ones that the border patrol catches and releases. We don't know how many additional ones are coming in on top of that, but uh, you know, we've got all these people coming in. That's, you know, putting more demands on, on energy use. Um, like I said, it's just a, uh, it's just the whole thing is just wacko. We we need to get a grip. Is xenophobic? We need to get a grip and get rid of these uh, Democrat. We know we have to get these Democrats. Suppose the Democrats are really Marxists. You know, it's just all this Marxist socialist stuff. We got to get rid of. Afraid of anything? Go back to Canada, America, right? And I'm I'm done. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, I noticed that Tracy and Janice have had numerous comments in the chat. Why don't one of you guys go ahead and start your rebuttal? Unless, Ken, if you're ready, you can also speak. We got we're, we're, this is the rebuttal period now. Now is the chance to say your piece. Who would like to go next? Raj, anything? Okay, Tracy, go ahead. Unmute and uh, let's uh, hear your rebuttal. Give me just a few seconds, Tim, to prepare my comment. I'm working on a note here uh, yeah, i'm almost just fine. I'm, almost, I'm almost done um i'll just say quickly thank you tim and i agree with you and bob um i'm happy to see that people are interested in actually solving problems instead of just talking well ken what did you uh if you were to grade me tonight how do you think i did on the presentation overall i know um I well, like, and, you know, there's areas where you could have improved, and those are mostly the uh, presentation stuff, having an updated, uh, right. I, uh, updated slides. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there were a couple of times that you misspoke, too, right. um, as long as you're aware of that. I want to make sure. Well, I, I, <laughs> but it wasn't, it was a good presentation, and the, uh, the core of your information, I think, is solid. And, um, you know, it's one new technology, so there might not be a lot of research on the particular use of thorium as a fuel, but nuclear has been around for so long that there's enough science that I, I feel confident about it. I'm not a uh, nimbyist type person. If I could have one of these in Algonquin, I'd be happy to have it. Like yeah. uh, you'd have that beaker plant. We, I probably have the same uh, energy use as you being up here at the top of the hill. So I'm sure I get my energy from that uh, peaker plant in East Dundee. So that was interesting to uh, learn about. There's a lot out there and I thank you, Ken. Okay, Tracy, are you ready now? It, yeah. Go yeah, right thanks, ahead, Tim. please. Uh, I, um, although I don't agree with it, um, and 
don't have the expertise to say why. Um, I thought you did a good job, Tim. You made me a little more um, skeptical about my certainty of being anti-nuclear. I'm certainly anti-nuclear uh, as nuclear power exists now and has existed historically. Um, but with your description of this thorium thing, it sounds like a different animal and I don't fully understand it and don't understand it enough to, enough to, have to, explain. to, to totally reject it. Um, I wrote down a couple of notes while you were speaking, if I, if I may read those, um, even if they're a little bit dated, given some of the conversation we've had since then. Um, and um, with, without being insulting, I hope you don't take it as an insult. I, I, I won't be because, you know, the thing is, I, the feedback, if I can't take the heat, I should get out of the kitchen. So, but I did, I wrote, you know, I wanted to ask you when you started, um, when, you know, when you talk about thorium nuclear, I think about nuclear as it's existed, uh, you know, uh, in Chernobyl and in all the crises we, we, we've been talking about, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, um, other nuclear problems, which are many. Um, so I, 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 I grasp the term, the concept in, in, that, in that context. And so when you began your talk, I wrote down, are you an Ayn Rand devotee? Because it seemed to me that you won't let facts get in the way of this um, free market ideology of not, of, you know, everything will be okay if we could just buy and sell and trade freely, which I don't agree with. And you made a comment that if we want prosperity, we need more electricity. And what, what if we don't want more prosperity? Why do we need more prosperity? What is prosperity? And I mean, how about simple survival? What's wrong with that as co compared with prosperity? Um, what does it prosper us if we gain material things and gain luxuries, but lose the earth to live on? And then one other thing that I would like to say is in response to Bob, um, and I can see that if I, I can see these are gonna be perennial clashes, but I get so angry when I hear people say that we have socialism today. Um, we have nothing resembling socialism unless it be socialism for the rich or to put it in, in terms Noam Chomsky did, um, uh, costs and risks for everybody and profits for the few. I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, catching the nuance of that term. Um, <clears throat> We have the socialization of costs and risks and the privatization of profit. That's the kind of socialism we have, socialism for the rich. For example, a $1.5 trillion military budget every year when you figure in every expense. For example, the bailout in 2008, which was a down payment of $800 billion followed up by years of quantitative easing, which added trillions of dollars to that bailout. The most reliable number of which I've seen is about $14 trillion. All of that, most of that money went to the Wall Street bankers that had made casino bets on Wall Street and turned up snake eyes. And, and they had to be bailed out, AIG, 
uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, that whole rotten capitalist lot. They're the ones who enjoy socialism. You see people shaking cups on the streets, living under bridges. Am I really to believe that those people enjoy a socialist economy? You have got to be kidding me. That's it. Okay, Tracy, who's now? Um, uh, Jen. Tim, Tim, I, I like to speak. Go right ahead, Raj. You got a few minutes, and uh, okay. I'd love to see, love to hear what you have to say tonight. I I think uh, Bob and uh, the other speaker, they, they both made a very good point from different sides of the spectrum. In uh, American democracy, we have a ignorant, uneducated farmers, low life people, very rich people, very smart people, and that's what makes it democracy. And that democracy, that means we have all kinds of people. And Bob matter is wrong that we should have only sophisticated people deciding things. The, the, I'm not worried about uh, nuclear energy, uh, what we talk here, because uh, I think we have, we have a very robust system. It has to go through the regular regulation and Congress and the government and plus, uh, above all, in America to do something, we need investors. So there is investor community, they should be willing to invest in something to it happen. So we can talk everything. And if, uh, if uh, Thorium comes out with a reliable and a scientifically workable hypothesis, then probably America will adopt it. I have no doubt about that. If you are more efficient, you are cheaper than anybody else, the market will take care of care of that thing. And right now, what I see is that, and now of course, uh, the coal is not going to go away and from the world. You know, that the India, India and China cannot afford to let coal go because they need lots of energy and not all their people are poor. They are still way behind us. They, they, they have a tremendous poverty. You know, India, India's income is 10% of the award income per capita. They're poor and India, India is much better off than other 150 countries. So think about that. So coal is not going to go away. The, 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 and so something happening, which investors are very excited about last, last month or two months is a fusion energy. Okay, it's, it's going to happen. Science has developed and technology is fast developing and investors are for that. Lots of scientists are for that. Lots of governments are for that because, because that, that is a game changer. That means we don't need a coal. We, we, don't, we don't need a thorium. We don't need a uranium. We don't need nothing. And we can do it, okay? But it's there. And uh, it may be the future. I, I trust scientists. I trust government, communists and capitalists both and the socialists. And I, I trust the world. And I trust the educated people. We have more and more people getting educated. And I see a bright future for, for the people who are to come after us. Thank you. OK, Raj. Janice, you've been quite active in the chat. Let's hear what you got to say. Unmute. And well, I just wanted to back up what Tracy said about socialism and Bob Matter's comment about us living in a socialist state. Um, and I just hope Bob never uses um, Medicare or uh, social, uh, social Security uh, because there was a lot of pushback when those items were passed. Um, and I wanted to bring up also uh, some other things that our legislators have done, like in 1964, when the agricultural secretary told farmers to get big or get out and use Monsanto to do that. Well, he didn't mention Monsanto, but that's when Monsanto became huge um, because we got um, all kinds of toxins on the food we eat so we could so supposedly feed the world, but we don't feed the world. We feed animals. 
we need to change our agricultural system and all of us need to demand this, that uh, we uh, uh, have a agricultural system based on regenerative agriculture. That is feed the soil, don't uh, steal the topsoil through um, the type of agriculture monoculture that we have now. Um, and uh, as far, I, I hope everybody clicks on that article um, that was in Medium today um, on what we, uh, it was from a soldier who, a female soldier who uh, was in two tours in Afghanistan and the most recent was 2010. And she knew then that as soon as we left, the Taliban would take over. It was more than obvious to her because uh, they were supposed to be training uh, the local people. Uh, and uh, she saw how that was working or not working. Uh, so click on that article <laughs> and read it. Uh, and then uh, email the president, email Congress and tell them to uh, do as uh, Medea Benjamin tweeted a few days ago to cut in half the military budget and instead um, get everybody housed, uh, give us uh, universal health care um, and things like that. Thank you. Okay, Janice, uh, who else has got a rebuttal? Uh, I know Charlie does, probably Ellen's got another one. Tony, you wanna say anything? We're still looking to get people in rebuttals here because I, uh, Otherwise, we could uh, I could give my final comments and wrap it up. But Charlie, you always got more to say. Ellen, you want to go ahead for about four or five minutes? Okay. You know, um, I will. I've kind of, you guys pretty much know my spin on this, but I'll try to, you know, try to add something more convincing. Um, you know, I, I think we need to, look at it. I watched a movie last night on the great debaters. And um, there, this was about a, on the civil rights, Denzel Washington said in the 60s that this small school actually beat Harvard in a debate. And, um, but the method, you know, which is something we should, we need to think like this again. I don't, I think we're just getting more like propaganda, you know, more like lobbyist, more like advertising, rather than two-sided actual debate of issue. And, you know, the, it's, it's scary because a lot, I come here for free speech forum, this, you know, and I think that you just don't see that in Congress or the policies. As I said, I, I think people should be horrified that they signed a a contract like the contract with America to be put into office as a Democrat or a Republican, you have to sign that I will stay at war in Israel. You know, this is the revisionist Zionist plot that has been there for it's a real thing. And um, you never see it though, but that we will stay at war, you know, defend our national security. We what Peter Dale Scott very says it's an empire, an imperialist system, but it's invisible. You know, in 1930, Smedley Butler uh, wrote, War is a racket, you know, um, and this it's exactly the truth of today. But back then, you know, he well, he was actually to get through to Roosevelt and um, and he had proof the DuPont and J.P. Morgan, these people that that George Seldes wrote about, Smedley Butler, the leading general, um, you know, they came and said, we want you, we don't like um, Roosevelt's New Deal, we don't like all this, you know, regulation, um, why don't you uh, organize a coup, because all the veterans from World War I are upset that they're not getting any of their money or promises, and Smedley Butler had the integrity to say, I, you know, I fought this war for South America so that the Dulles brothers could win this for, for United Fruit and the banks could, 
you know, take over the world. That's what our war is. And that's what our corporations are. The, you look at the Dow Industrial, they are the same ones Ford sent, you know, fueled the gas to Hitler that enabled him to fight his war. You know, everything that is still in place, the the pharmaceuticals, Bayer and, and Eigel Farben, and our, we're all, as I've talked about this, the Nazi Hydra in America. You know, this is this has been going on for a long time. These are the facts. This is, you know, nobody can disagree with the facts, but you can make sure that nobody sees them. You know, the, um, the management of savagery. Every, this is the danger is that because the, the deep state, the Illuminati, the, the, you know, the power elites, they, you know, the crown, how many billions do they have? Every billionaire, Bill Gates, look at Steve Corbett on Bill Gates. They have the billions, but yet now after Citizens United, they can, um, they have that speech. So, but it's just, they've got a billion times more than any of us have. And because they control the software, the cyber technology, the internet through Cambridge Analytica and the entire, through this promised software, they, they captured that from, it was made by the Justice Department, CIA, NSA, but now the NSA runs the world with this stolen software from Bill Hamilton. He's, they killed Danny Casalero who was exposing it. They killed like 20 people who tried to expose it. You know, that this is our government military industrial complex takeover of the world, you know, and they can just erase the voice of the left wing. You know, we're, we're just investigative journalists like Oliver Stone, like, you know, Robert Perry. I mean, all the, you'd never heard of these people because they were whistleblowers, you know, they're really blowing the whistle, but it's like easy just to erase them and make, you know, and run somebody against somebody like Paul Finley was put in there, Dick Durbin, you know, if you got Cynthia McKinney, who was going to be speaking at 9-11 conference in Washington, I'm on a, her new group, and she speaks up about why don't we not go to this war on terror, because we manufactured this whole thing so that we could do the war on terror. It was a, the New World Order plot by Richard Cheney, billionaire, Halliburton, billionaire, you know, Rumsfeld, billionaire, you know, Rumsfeld, Monsanto, he, he owned Gilead, which makes remdesivir, which is the only therapeutic way to get the virus, the COVID virus. You know, get Fauci made the patent that is the coronavirus, and then they sell you the vaccine every year, three times a year. They get the billions. You expose that, like Robert F. Kennedy has, and they they erase Robert Kennedy. So nobody hears Robert Kennedy's voice. They a conspiracy theory. They call me conspiracy theory throw me off of the internet, you know, um, deep platform, 200,000. And that's what, hello, you know, this is a killer virus, but we can't tell you this. I posted this thing, this woman, they, these are planned variants, bio warfare with the dates. They're right here, World Economic Forum, you know, John Hopkins. Okay, so they, the plan was to come out with the Delta virus, June 21, and then see if this plays out. July, there's the Epsilon, the, the Zeta, the Eta. But the shot does not prevent a disease that does not exist. It installs an operating system in your body that will be manipulated with 5G system in order to control you and enforce your compliance. Subsequent yearly upgrades will become mandatory until you are disposed of as a useless eater. The first such upgrade is scheduled for September 2021. The last COVID variant is scheduled for February 2023, meaning by the end of 2023, 7 billion people are scheduled to die. They will not stop the variants until 7 billion people are dead. Only we can stop this if we stick together and refuse to take the kill shot. No, this has never been on NPR. It's never been on CBS, Fox News. Graham said it, but they like now they've all backed off of him as a crazy man. You know, you need to be open to the hypothesis thinking we your ideas about you know this this technology is fixed data propaganda driven and it, it's not really the hypothesis is 
is it a big lie? I, every time I've checked this stuff, I was a libertarian, I was a Republican. I've been, you know, I'm an independent, I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, I don't care. I just want the truth from my government, from my corporations and from my friends. I just want, if you're having a debate with somebody, they hear you and it's not just coming out. They call it read only memory, like being a computer system. Bob is a read only memory. You cannot write to his understanding that I'm a communist, I'm a, I'm a feminist, I'm a transsexual, crazy liberal nutcase. I'm not, I am just trying to get the truth. You know, and we cannot, this neoliberal narrative has really been brainwashed into people by the, by the military, just, you know, there's this MK Ultra plan that it's just scary the way people have been brainwashed to just write off, you know, and that we, our government created Marx, I, they created Stalin on the left, these are extremists and they created these right-wing nutcases, you know, Rumsfeld and Cheney and, and the neocons that, you know, the New Republic, the Burnham, the manager's revolution, what came in the 30s, the whole idea was the managers will take over the world and labor will get less and less and less, consumers will get less and less and less, and look what happened, it really did. Inequality has spread so that we are all getting less and less. Prince Philip had, you know, and Cheney and says, Will and William Casey, when he canceled the Fairness Doctrine in the 80s and took over ABC and then took over all the media with his Federalist Society, Opus Dei, Vatican, said, you know, when nobody understands anything, we will have succeeded. They have dumbed us down to total programmed 1984 style stupid, you know, and just like Brave New World, just like any of these warnings, wake up guys, you know, the, our whole purpose of liberal education or, you know, conservative education is be able to think critically about, you know, that there, this is a machine and this Cold War, new Cold War, new world order thinking is killing us. And, and that's their aim. They want they want half a billion people. They think that's the only sustainable thing like Malthus. And the rest of us are, they're like, we got to get rid of everybody. Oh, let's, let's give right, them let's a value up, so they don't have babies anymore. And that's what yeah. it's coming down to. This is the facts. Dinefork, okay. Carlisle, these are the ones, this is what they're doing. It's a fourth right. right. Read Jim Mars. Thank All right, you. Ellen, let's wrap it up. Thanks. All right, who's next? Okay. Anybody? Okay, anybody else next? Yeah, I'll go, Timmy. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Everybody, all right. Thanks a lot, Tim, for a, a nice presentation and your uh, your cartoons. I <laughs> yeah. think I like better than a, a cartoon where everything works out and turns out okay. You know, that's a real reflection of the real world. <laughs> uh, I've got three points I'll be eclectic on. Number one, I, I studied psychology of learning. And there's people, how learn, people learn things. And there was something that was rather unique. Um, people try to memorize stuff and prepare for examinations, but there's something called one trial learning. What is one trial learning is best expressed as you only have to touch the hot stove once. Then oh, you shouldn't do that. And that's somewhat like uh, nuclear is you try to distance yourself from the calamities that have taken place in the technology. And I don't know if you're entirely successful. Now I will reveal to the community that as a young man in junior high, I actually did a major science project in which I built a nuclear reactor. My uncle, in fact, was employed at Oak Ridge during the war. And I have been down there many times. Um, the one thing you look at nuclear technology, it basically it seemed to be relatively simple and easy. And actually it is. There's no great complexity to it. 
what they did at the University of Chicago was 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 not a, a terribly sophisticated uh, experiment in some regards. The first reaction, um, however, that's the key. You're dealing with you're setting in motion a chain reaction, and now you've got to change your stance altogether. It may appear simple, the technology, but you're dealing with uh, some very, very complex uh, events taking place and you're acting a bit contrary to what takes place in nature. Now also in learning uh, in making the science project, I became familiar with something called the periodic table of elements. And if you look at the bottom of it, they have certain elements that are separate from the others. And right next to that radium and thorium and uranium are all elements that are listed together in close proximity. And for a reason, is that these radioactive elements all have a part to play in the chain reaction process. Now to come along later and try to separate yourself from this family of elements or community of elements is quite frankly nonsensical. But anyone can look at it and see that you're dealing in essentially the same thing. Uh, and to try to have to separate yourself uh, from it is, is not, not alchemy. This is, this is not alchemist activities. Um, nevertheless, yeah, there is a reason it's separate. These are events that don't occur in nature. They can go out of control. We've seen what they do in developing explosives. Uh, and when they get out of control, it's beyond human intervention to take make corrective actions. So you want to do something like this, where there's something you human, it is beyond the control of the best resources we have to control this. So this is something you are actually suggesting. And I'm amazed you're actually serious about this. Um, and last of all, I did speak about uh, predicting technology of the future. Now, some time ago, I gave a lecture to the railroad club and the college complexes on the future of transportation as predicted on the covers from the 30s and so forth of popular science magazine. All sorts of strange vehicles were going to be common inventions. Airplane cars and everyone was going to get cars that convert to airplanes and back forth and, and everyone was going to have a helicopter, things of this nature and beyond that. Uh, not one of which achieved any degree, I like this term, commercial success. Um, they're entertaining, they, but that's what I mean. There's, you're right on the same, I hate to say this, but you're on the cover of popular science. And while those may be somewhat some interesting reading, um, I think if you went back retroactively and say how many of those were actually turned into the real world, you'd find almost little, very few, if any, or none. Now, the last thing I hear is that, oh, we have better do this because someone else is going to do it or get a lead or a head start and we will be 
left behind. If that's what you want to do in terms of this technology, I say be my guest. Go ahead. If you want to put nuclear reactors uh, or nuclear devices, I've got to be careful here because you you change the term. It's something different, right? You ought to do some. I'll call it a time. How about atomic? Is that okay? Atomic yeah. machines around your country, you are free to do so. Um, that's, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to be concerned or to say that either we do this. Uh, now, the last thing of all, this is technology. It is not going to have one bit. You talk with this to be about climate change. Well, this technology failed the test because it's not going to do anything to deter the precipitation of, of climate change. As a matter of fact, if, if it took 10 years to build one reactor, how many long would it take to, to build enough to have any effect on the energy needs of the nation. <laughs> 50 years, uh, I, I, the time frame works against you. It's not commercially ready now. You have no conceivable idea if and when, if and when it ever will be, but then you posit this to be as a solution. And I say, on what basis do you make this claim? Uh, but no one asks questions, I guess, except Charlie. And he's a difficult person, I guess. Anyhow, thanks a lot, Tim. It was interesting. And uh, right. come again to, with your society. I, I like you guys. All right. Uh uh, Tony, you've been there for a little bit. You want to speak a little bit because you just put a nice uh, little bit of little bit of an article in there. So go sure, ahead. yeah, I, I just I just threw some some uh, some quick article links that I found. I I found this 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 uh, Zoom on on Meetup uh, this afternoon. I thought it would be a pretty interesting topic because I've heard the, the argument about nuclear power being one of the answers for you know energy and and um, the the environment. So. Thought I'd sit in, so uh, been been a very entertaining and enlightening uh, discussion so far. Um, one of the things I'll just point out what I just found here in the last little bit, but you know, you, you referenced the article about China <clears throat> working on a uh, a reactor, and they had a, a comment down further down in that article where they said um, they were talking about the Oak Ridge um, reactor that you referenced earlier. Right. It says, it says, quote, however, the experiment, the experiment and the many others which followed, including an experimental reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, which operated for many years, ran into problems. Corrosion caused by the hot salt cracked pipes and the weak radioactivity of thorium makes it very difficult for fission reactions to build up to sustainable levels without adding uranium. The investigations into thorium stopped. And then it says it's not yet clear how 60 years later, Chinese researchers have solved these technical problems. So, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I've, I've kind of observed with China is they're, <clears throat> because of their kind of their um, goal to, you know, be a, whether they want to admit it or not, be a, be a superpower, be a superpower in, in the world, they, they're they willing to try pretty much anything to um, to advance their, their, their ultimate goal. So, um, I think this is one of those in terms of energy uh, production and consumption. Because further down in the article, they also mentioned that China's also in, in the process of adding another 430 gigawatts of solar and wind capacity over the next five years. So they're they're you know they're they're making multiple bets of different types of energy uh, production to try to, to try to uh, promote that cause. Um, then I found a an article about. Um, Actually, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are working on an investment in a uh, thorium plant out in Wyoming, right. and they, they talked about that uh, requiring, also requiring uranium to um, 
to drive the, the reaction with the thorium. So I think it's, <clears throat> that's one of the, I, I think it makes it less, um, maybe less safe and less, uh, um, you know, attractive of, a, of an option to, to, um, to traditional nuclear than, than maybe, you know, we think it is. So I think there's still a lot of concerns around the, the, the safety of, uh, of thorium. And Tony, it's completely understandable where you're at. Um, I, I, when I, when I first learned about all this stuff, I too was skeptical very much so because these guys are making claims that are absolutely fantastic and preposterous at the times when I thought about it. Um, there hey, was... Tim, Tim, why are the Chinese making all those solar panels? Charlie, we're not going to go right. I'm going to address that in a minute. The Chinese are making solar panels because they can and they're cheap in China right now. There's also a big waste problem with solar panels, but the Chinese are trying to get their environment cleaned up. That's why they're you doing it. They're all the, the, the experts on thorium. So they what, have got 600 they build people. factories with, that make solar panels. Because they're doing an all of no a strategy to get get out, get to get get their pollution out. They're trying to get off fossil fuels. I never said I was against renewables. I just why would said they it's build not going to power the entire factory? world. Yeah, why would they build a solar factory if it was going to close? Charlie, you know, I'm not against renewables, okay? I'm not against wind or solar power. I'm just simply saying they're not going to replace oil or a high-density energy source anytime soon. And to, for you to sit there and think that renewables are going to power the world is nothing but a pure pipe dream. We will need high sources of energy, high concentrated sources of power. And the only way I see that happening right now is through nuclear. Right now, every single day, does do renewables supply more or less? I'm not power? just, I'm not uh, gonna go against you, Charlie, because I'm very aware of what renewables every do. Every single day is more energy provided by renewables isn't it? There is, Charlie. But if you also look, uh, if you look at the short history of nuclear power, it's also providing energy, and a lot of it, and in a lot more concentrated form than renewables ever could. Listen, I, like I said, I, like I said, listen, the guy said, and the guy, the guy, Professor Bob, just got solar panels put on his house. Yes, I know. So you're telling me he's going to go? Why would he need nuclear? Charlie, the thing is, you may have solar, solar panel on you may have solar panels on your home to provide <laughs> your own power. But what are you going to do about steel production? What, what are you going to do about to... high energy recycling? What are you going to do about advanced industrial processes? Right now, most of them are either burning coal or using a lot of power off the grid for high yeah, industrial heat. There's no heavy industry left in the United States. That's because guys like you have driven it out of the United States. Well, there's no need for it. Well, oh, there's shit. U.S. steel in Gary, Indiana. They make the most Lots steel of, left of it. Charlie, it's like what I said, you environmentalists are driving all of the heavy industry out of the U.S., running it to third world countries where it's unregulated. And the thing is, Charlie, it's just like I said, Never you'd heard rather of have before. us in your socialist utopia watching these things. All right, I'm oh, sorry. Energy. Is there anybody else that would like to give a rebuttal tonight? If not, I'm going to do my uh, closing remarks. And uh, right. Tim, you're not going to have any customers for your energy. <laughs> well, Charlie, you know, if renewables can do it, let it do it. But I just don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. Because when you look at the scale of utilities and what it's going to require, particularly in that report, the roadmap to nowhere, you're going to find out that it's going to be a lot costlier to go with renewables than we will the rest of the stuff. The thing is, is that solar panels only have a lifetime of about 40 years. Wind power is also going to need a lot of replacement. And that's going to take steel. That's going to take a lot more power and a lot more stuff than we've got right now. My yeah, whole premise, my whole premise on nuclear power is that it's a concentrated source of energy. Tim, there's a company right by my house where they put, they produce their own energy. They meet their needs of their operation. They don't go to anybody. 
No, oh, good for them, Charlie. That, the new installation up. Charlie, the thing is, is that uh, there's a lot coming down the pipeline with energy science. I just don't think that we should discount the nuclear option because it's what's going to eventually power the world on a mass industrial scale. The other things that Thorium... What, right mass, and does, what mass industry are you talking about? Charlie, um, there's no arguing with you because you're so set in your ways, but I'm just saying nuclear is going to do it. Well, I'm going to close... Mass industry? Charlie, obviously you have no clue about how the world works in a lot of ways, about what it takes to even run the internet. You know, an eight-second cat video that is powered that, that you run on YouTube, if you took all the energy in the aggregate, it That's would be the same as running a, hundred, a car That's at 30 miles an hour for industry. about an eighth of a mile. That's not heavy industry, Carl. It takes heavy industry, like machine not tools, like steel, industry. like everything else to make Who's the stuff we steel? have today. Where do they make and if you steel? don't think so, you're crazy because we have to have heavy industry to produce steel to produce the solar panels, to produce the wind turbines, to produce the stuff. How do you think, how do you think we're going to get them if we don't have heavy industry? You're all for renewables, but you don't want to produce it anywhere. I mean, you're going to need steel. You're going to need concrete. You're going to need all this stuff. And a renewable farm, you're going to have like 50 wind turbines that are, are like there. It's going to be like they're building 50 skyscrapers in a lot of cases. And that's going to be a lot of material. Not Why is everybody complaining right about NAFTA? Charlie, you know, again, your socialist utopia and the Green New Deal is not conceivable. It is not going to work. Um, the thing is, it'll cause an excessive tax burden. I'm not against uh, government, um, you know, government things like but I think we need to do a much better job of, of How did that guy having a solar panel on his house create a tax. There's rate? nothing wrong with him having a solar panel on What's his roof to, to account his energy costs. I never said that that was a way to do it. I'm saying that the wide scale use of renewable energy will not be enough to power an advanced industrial society like we have today. They have to get cheaper than coal, cheaper than other things in order to be a viable thing. And I think the nuclear option, especially with the widespread deployment of molten salt reactors is gonna be the way we do it over time. I will quote Richard Martin one more time. This thorium revolution is eventually gonna happen, whether it be now or 50 years from now, because it is simply too common, too good, and too much of a good power source. Yeah, if I buy one of those solar powered fans do i need a nuclear reactor charlie again you know you're taking uh a, a, no never mind it you it, it, it's useless i'm going to make my closing remarks real quick i'm going to be real fast about it this is a somewhat of a humorous thing as some of you have seen this before but it's a uh, thorium opera it was done at one of the thorium energy alliance conferences it's called Aria de Thorium. It's done by Eric Meyer. And I think it will, I think the song pretty much will summarize my viewpoints on it. Um, and I think, again, it's for your entertainment purposes. It's going to be about maybe two minutes long, if that. But I think we'll, uh, I honestly think that you guys will enjoy this. And I'm going to use it as my closing remarks for my presentation tonight, and then we'll keep the Zoom call open afterwards. Here we go. We must stop playing with all our futures. This is the moment, this is the moment when we all decide to fight for the earth. Time is wasting, we must be hasting, we'll lose the tracks so we decide it all. Tick tock, tick tock, as this is not. There is a chance to save us, we must do 
There you go, thorium molten salt reactors, and uh, what I honestly think might be the way to go. Therefore, I conclude my presentation tonight, and uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, and uh, we'll now be able to get into any further discussion with the after party. Thank you guys for showing up. I really appreciate <laughs> your listening to me tonight, and I hope all of you have a good night and see you next week. <laughs>